Okay, good morning everyone, uh, or good very early morning in the US, or good afternoon in China, wherever you're watching from. Uh, this is our agenda for today. We are uh, concluding the um, weeks-long effort, eight-week-long effort, or actually even longer, as you'll see in a minute, of this summer's workshop. Uh, today we'll hear from two of the four teams, the explainability for diarization rhization team and the better together team. And then tomorrow we'll hear from the two other teams. So these are two full days of information-packed sessions. And just to get you started, I'll give you a little bit of an overview, both a mix of history and sort of my take on what we've accomplished uh, this summer. Right? So with that in mind, uh, also let me say to the online audience, uh, while this is being streamed on YouTube, which tends to be a one-way channel, there is a chat box open. And if uh, you have any questions for the presenters, you should type into the chat box. Uh, one of us here, Pablo, is uh, uh, watching the chat, and he will be your question asker or spokesperson in the room. So online audience, you're welcome to ask questions if you like. If he may use his judgment to decide when to interrupt the speakers, or if we're running short of time, he may decide not to ask too many questions, but leave that to him, and uh, we'll continue with our business. All right, okay. So this is the ninth uh, workshop that we've been calling the Frederick Jelinek Memorial Workshop. And this is the first of two days where we'll look at what we've accomplished in, these, uh, in, in this summer. But as I have said to you in my opening presentation as well, uh, this was called Jelinek Workshop only starting about 2014 after Jelinek passed away in 2010. But the workshop itself has a much longer history. Uh, it started with this idea from uh, SCAMP. SCAMP, I think, stands for Summer Camp for Applied Mathematics and Probability. It was started at the Institute for Defense Analyses in Princeton, and they had a tradition of mathematicians working on cryptography problems all summer together, and it was very successful. They have a long track record of achieving big things. And uh, Jordan Cohen, who used to be at IDEA at the time, thought we should do something like this in speech and language. So he got together with his friend Jim Flanagan, and they started organizing these. The first two were in 1993 and 94, so that's really 30 years ago, uh, at Rutgers. Uh, and around the same time, Fred Jelinek came to Hopkins. The Center for Language and Speech Processing was started then. And the various sponsors who sponsored the workshops both wanted to have it closer to Washington, D.C., and they wanted Jelinek to organize it because he was known to be uh, both a good organizer and a well-accomplished person in the field. So the workshops as we know them today came to Hopkins in 95. So by that count, this is 28 years since uh, the workshops have been, like the Hopkins workshops, if you will. So that's our history. And just to give you a little perspective, in 95, uh, the switchboard word error rates, which today a lot of people correctly or falsely claim has reached human parity, the recognition on that used to have 55% error rate, meaning we got more words wrong than right. Uh, Spanish telephone speech was about 80% error rate. I think if you get a few articles right, you'll probably get 10% accuracy, so you're getting the articles and a few other words, that's it. So from there, we've come a long way. Today you have conversational AI and you have Whisper and so on and so forth. So the workshops have played a big role in making that happen. So uh, for example, in 95, uh, we were already working on language modeling. If you look at the titles of the four teams, they all have language modeling in them. So today, everybody thinks, oh, wow, big, large language models. But this has been a concern of this field for more than 30 years at this point. Uh, I particularly highlight Ronnie Rosenfeld because I was a grad student in this workshop. And I was working on adapting models using minimum divergence principles. And Ronnie Rosenfeld had just finished his PhD thesis. And so he was sort of mentoring me and saying, yeah, this is good. You should do it. Ronnie today is the head of the machine learning department at CMU and so on and so forth. We, the 96 workshop had four teams as well, 97, another four teams, and this one I highlight Mike Riley because he actually is a participant in this workshop. So there are many people who are repeat visitors and it's a very enriching experience. And this workshop, Michael's team actually started this whole business of trying to understand pronunciations and figuring out what variations happen in spontaneous speech and so on and so forth. And in those days, I used to have hair on my head, as they say, and Fred Jelinek was still very much in charge of CLSP and so on and so forth. Uh, going forward, 98, we had three teams. Uh, I want to point out Jan Haich because Haich is responsible for taking these workshops on the road, getting them out of Baltimore. Because remember, from 95 on, they were all in Baltimore until 
Hi, said, I'll host one in Prague. So I'll call him out for that. Thank you, Jan. Uh, in 99, again, we had four teams. And here I highlight this team because uh, statistical or like, you know, data-driven methods in machine translation were actually not the norm until there was this groundbreaking paper from IBM. And then the IBM guys all disappeared, joined the hedge fund, and made more money than knew what they could do with. Uh, but the field didn't have anything to continue that work. So this team essentially revived. Kevin Knight put together a team, and statistical machine translation came back to the research world with a big bang. And the slogan of that team was machine translation in a day. They built all the infrastructure and the modeling and the tools that if you had a data set ready, within one day you could produce a machine translation system. So it, was, it made quite some waves, and many people sort of you know, still remember that team. Uh, in 2000, again, we had four teams. And this time, again, I'm showing these names. You don't have to remember them. Just remember there's lots of activity over the last 30 years. The workshop has been paying at like, you know, avant-garde topics right from the beginning. So already in 2000, we were looking at joint modeling of text and uh, speech and vision. And we were looking at audiovisual speech recognition, looking at lip movements, and, and so on and so forth. This is a team. Uh, this is just Haich. He's on the right over here. Uh, to his uh, right, to our left, is Eric Brill, who later on went to become the CTO of eBay. And nowadays, he says he's fun employed, meaning he's retired. Uh, then there are others you might recognize. There's Michael Collins, who's at Google. Bottom left, there is Doug Jones, who's at Lincoln Labs, and so on and so forth. Oh, I think I put this picture up because this team actually made a team t-shirt. And this tradition of team t-shirt started then, and a few other teams have replicated it. By the way, these are prized entities. 20 years later, you can wear it and still show solidarity with your team from that time. All right. Uh, what else? 2001, we had two teams. Uh, uh, oh, by the way, the number of teams in the workshops varies depending on funding and other things. So some years we had two, some years we had four. I'll, you'll see the record in a few minutes. Uh, this team, graphical models, you know how these waves come to academia and to research? Nowadays, everybody's talking about large language models. So the wave in those days was graphical models. Like, you know, there was a lot of activity, a lot of nice formalisms had been made, algorithms had been developed. Michael Jordan, who's a star in this field, had, was transitioning from MIT to Berkeley. He stopped by to give us lectures. And basically, uh, Jeff Zweig and Jeff Bilms decided that speech and language need graphical models. So they put together a very nice team, and people still remember this team. I'll also call out Dragomir Radev, uh, mainly because he passed away this year at a rather young age, unfortunately. Uh, Drago was known for many things. Uh, one of his most important contributions was to drive forward the field of summarization, and he had developed a toolkit called Mead, which many people in the field use, probably still use today. And he, start, he developed Mead at the workshop. So Jay Salt can claim we started diarization. I mean, Drago did, but yeah. Uh, 2002, again, four teams. 2003, uh, another four teams. Well, OK. It used to be four teams, but then SARS hit Hong Kong. And one of our teams was based in Hong Kong, so we had to cancel the whole team. So that's why it scratched out. But of course, another highlight of that workshop was Franz Ock. Uh, Franz, as you know, uh, did his PhD in machine translation with Herman Nye, was at USC as a postdoc. He led a workshop team in 2003 trying to put syntax into machine translation. And the next year, he joined Google and, translate, and started Google Translate. So you can say Google Translate sort of has its germs or its starting point in JSALT as well. So here's a picture. On the left are Jeff Zweig and Jeff Bilms trying to put graphical models into speech recognition. On the right is Franz Ock at one of the parties that some of you have experienced this summer. Uh, he didn't drink too much, though. He was a pretty sober guy. <laughs> All right. Uh, 2004, we had, again, three teams. And as usual, the workshop kept up its idea of not just doing speech and language, but with connecting with other fields. So this team worked on joint modeling of text and uh, images. So today, you guys are all excited by DALI and stable diffusion and things like that. Of course, those are generative models. But these guys were looking at uh, not so much synthesizing things, but jointly analyzing uh, images and text and so on in the service of retrieval. Uh, 2005, again, we had four teams. 2006, or oh, 2006 had Philip Kuhn leading a team. This team created the Moses uh, speech translation, sorry, Moses translation tools. So again, another uh, landmark achievement of our field, helped a lot of people do good research. This tools, toolkit came up at JSALT. Uh, 2007, again, two teams and so on. So some more pictures. On the right is Philip Kuhn as he looked back in those days, young and energetic. He's still very energetic, just not as young. 
and uh, on the left is uh, Manmatha, who was in the joint visual text modeling team, and he was a big proponent of trying to do joint modeling of images and video, and images and text, and trying to use that to access images. He used to be at UMass, I think he's with Amazon now or something. Right, keep going. Uh, 2008, uh, we again had three teams. The team that's titled Robust Speech Recognition is worth mentioning for two reasons. One is Lukash Burget led that team, and again, Lukash is here this summer, so we keep having these repeat visitors to the workshop, so all of you who are here for the first time, don't assume this is going to be your last time, you'll probably be here again. And uh, the other reason I mentioned that team is because that team came up with iVectors, and iVectors again moved forward the state of the art in speaker recognition by a big, um, big jump, and people still remember that team and a particularly noisy guy in that team who used to speak very loudly, whose picture I'll show you in a minute. <laughs> in 2009, there was another team which worked, which probably deserves mentioning as well. So one of them is low resource speech recognition. This team had a number of people, including Peter Schwartz, who's up there, and Dan Povey, who again visited the workshop, was led that team who visited the workshop this year. And this team is again notable for creating Kaldi. So Kaldi started with this team and uh, it has again helped move forward speech recognition. I would even say it has democratized speech recognition by making it available to people all over the world. Once the technology is there, we see a lot of growth in the field, a lot of applications to low resource languages and so on. Okay, uh, 2010, uh, again, three more teams. And this time I wanna call out the team that works on localizing objects and actions in video. So we started looking jointly at text and video. This is a fun team. They looked at uh, videos that involved uh, shows that have cooking, like cooking shows that says chop the onions, fry the potatoes, uh, sort out the parsley. So there are actions in this video. So they figured out how to associate actions in video with words in the transcript. And so it was a nice effort. Again, there's a lot of uh, like, you know, buzz about these technologies today, but we had interesting working prototypes even back then. So what, what am I telling you? This? What I'm telling you is that these days there's a lot more buzz because these deep learning techniques have made these things much more accurate. But the core modeling, the core ideas have been around on our field for a long time. And in fact, they've been because of our field that these things have grown and become big. So you should always be like, you know, very proud of the field you're working in and say that, yep, we are changing the world. Uh, 2011, again, uh, three teams. This time again, another one working on uh, visually descriptive text. So Alex and Tamara Berg are well-known people in the field of uh, joint text and uh, like, you know, image modeling. And they looked at, like, they had, by the way, they had these amazing demos and prototypes in the end. You'd give the computer a picture and it would come up with like, you know, somewhat broken but descriptive text like, this picture has one boy standing in front of one chair uh, with some one green box below it. Like, you know, it had some weird way of creating language, but it basically would understand images and give you a whole description of images. So this is the noisy guy in the iVector team, Najim Dehak, who's on the left, and uh, Dan Povey, who was here early in this workshop, the guy whose team started Kaldi. Uh, some more pictures, some more walk down memory lane. 2012, uh, we again had three teams. Uh, one of them worked on detailed understanding of objects and scenes. So Andre Vidaldi, he used to be at Oxford at the time. I think he still might be, I'm not sure. But all of you use VGG features for something or the other. This, this is the guy from the same Oxford visual geometry group. And these guys later on, like, you know, push forward a lot of the neural applications to images. But at that time, he was trying to do detailed models of objects using parts and so on and so forth. Uh, again, very good cross-disciplinary uh, research in the workshop. 2013, I was tired of organizing, and I said, guys, can I take a year off this year? People said, you can, but we're gonna organize. And so the workshop still happened in Baltimore. We still had a team, and this is a team, by the way, that worked on speaker recognition, and a lot of ideas about calibration, particularly unlabeled, unsupervised calibration, came about from this workshop, and they've done a good service to speaker recognition because uncalibrated systems, as you know, can often give you crazy results. So 2014, like I said, uh, HiH offered to have the workshop at Prague. So this is the first time JSALT went on the road. And this is when we started calling it the Jelinek workshop because Fred had passed away in 2010 and uh, he had always had a long association with Charles University in Prague. So Charles University wanted to do something to honor him and this all fit in nicely. So we had a workshop there and uh, that had three teams again working on uh, deep uh, linguistic meaning from text and cross-language meaning representations and so on. So, sorry, cross 
uh, lingual, multilingual meaning representations and so on. So we continued our on the road trend. In 2015, we went to Seattle. And uh, again, we had four teams. By the way, this team that I didn't highlight, I realized I probably should have continuous wideband machine translation. By then, neural translation was already a thing. People were doing it. But there weren't that many open source tools. It wasn't firmly established in academia. And Chris Dyer led a team that created a lot of tools, very big team with a lot of participants. And I think his tools are called Dynet. Graham Newbig still uh, develops it at CMU and it does great things. And basically, this went forward as a good topic. But the reason I highlighted Dong Hughes is that created another neural uh, modeling toolkit called, uh, oh, what is the Microsoft thing called? Uh, CNTK, yes, thank you. So framework for doing neural nets. Uh, it, I don't know how it stands today with respect to other frameworks, but again, Dong was one of the pioneers. He was the one who had impact in 2012 by showing that uh, a hybrid uh, speech recognition system with a neural front end was way better than what was there before. This was a 2011 or 2012 into speech paper by Dong, which basically picked up ideas from Jeff Hinton's group, but made it really practical on large scale systems. So that's Dong Yu for you at the Seattle workshop. Uh, left is Prague from, I think there's a chapel next to the uh, faculty of the uh, Department of Computational Linguistics, and this is Malusransky Namesti. On the right is a shot from uh, the building where the summer workshop was in Seattle. You don't see it very well, but somewhere over here, mm. wait, I want to go back. Ah, here we go. Right here somewhere, if you come and look really closely, it's Mount Rainier. So the campus at UW has a very nice uh, like you know, atmosphere, and in summer, it's one of the best. By the way, after November, don't go there, but <laughs> <laughs> all right. Summer is great in Seattle. OK, uh, 2016, we took a turn towards health applications. There were two teams that worked on health application of speech and language. One looked at text and social media. And it turns out that uh, a lot of people uh, their like an you know, emotional mental state shows up in the social media postings and you can actually use them to detect how people are responding when they are depressed how the treatment might be working they even were looking at suicide risks and had a, a nice data set that they could work with and there was some nice progress there another one worked on uh, neurodegenerative diseases either alzheimer's or parkinson's or things like that uh, which manifest themselves in speech and Lukash again, so like I said, we keep having repeat uh, visitors to JSALT, for which I'm very happy. Uh, 2017, we went to Pittsburgh, continued work on neural machine translation, and uh, uh, Emmanuel Dupu, who was here as a plenary speaker earlier, he did a lot of his work on unsupervised learning of uh, uh, linguistic units from speech. Uh, 2018, again, three more teams. Uh, the one I highlight called Multilingual End-to-End -end ASR for Incomplete Data, the title doesn't quite tell you, but this is the team that wrote the ESPNet toolkit. So today, if you're doing speech recognition, you're using ESPNet, thank JSALT. It started here, right? Uh, so here on the left is a uh, flank Frank Lloyd Wright house. It's called Falling Water, very close to Pittsburgh, so that's how I remember Pittsburgh. On the right is the ESPNet team. You see Shinji Watanabe on, the on, the, on your right. He, is, uh, he led the team. On the left is Yenda Tramal, who's back here somewhere. He's always, you know, whenever some good things happen with big toolkits, you see Yenda somewhere in the background. So watch out for him. Twin uh, well, this is the last. I'm coming to an end. So 2019, we were in Montreal, and we had a big explosion of teams. There were lots of teams in Montreal, five of them. It was hard to manage. Luckily. I didn't go to Montreal, so Yenda managed it for us. Uh, but it was a great time. And then 2020, we had a tough time because uh, COVID had just broken out and uh, the whole world was in lockdown. But we'd been preparing right until March when they shut down the whole world. We said, no, we can't stop the workshop. So we had a virtual one. There were three teams, and uh, two teams. There were actually three before, but one of the teams decided not to do virtual. They wanted to come back another year in person. So we had two teams. And again, we were working on chatbots. They're the big rage these days, but the workshop was already paying attention to them, trying to understand how to model them, how to evaluate them, and so on. 2022 is when, uh, oh, we had to skip 21, because there was no way we were going to organize in the middle of all this like you know, lockdown. 22, we had three teams again, and Anthony, who came there to see how the workshop was done, 
thought it was a great idea, didn't just realize how much work is behind it, and signed up to do it this year. <laughs> so thanks to Anthony, we are in Le Mans today. Right? So how did we get to Le Mans? Well, actually, before that, pictures. Top right is the workshop team in uh, Montreal, and uh, bottom left is the team in Baltimore last year. All right. So the way we started this is we put out a call for proposals. Uh, people responded with various ideas. So we, we said, oh, we want ideas in speech, in text processing, in multimodality. And we explicitly called out for explainability, privacy, equity, because these are becoming important issues. And as you'll see in a bit, we got uh, proposals in all the areas. And we ended up picking four, which covered three of these areas. So what happened, really? So basically, we received about 20 ideas. By the way, when, say, when, when I say we receive ideas, people write out about a page saying, it'll be cool to have a team to work on this. It'll be cool to have so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. They think of their dream team to work on the problem. And say, OK, sounds like a good idea. A uh, couple of them were very preliminary and not suited for being in the workshop. And for other people, when they said, look, we need you in person to have the discussions. Oh, I thought I could do this remotely. So they withdrew afterwards. And about 14 people showed up with their ideas to discuss them. We invited both the authors and a whole bunch of other people uh, so that they could discuss things. Altogether, we had 50 researchers uh, in the room that weekend, two full days. And uh, we had uh, most of them were from academia, two thirds of them, a very healthy representation of industry, because as you all know, these problems are now of a lot of interest to industry, and a few government sponsors or potential sponsors, as you'll see in a minute. And, uh, Basically, we just debated, argued, made the proposals better, critiqued them, gave feedback. The authors and others revised them, discussed them again, kept doing this until we finally emerged with uh, proposals that we thought were solid enough to vote on. And five of them got voted as strongly competitive, meaning if you could find the funding, we should have them. So we went after funding for five of them. As it happened, we were able to find funding for only four. So these are the four that we have this summer. So the team led by Lucas Ondel, whose long winding title is Finite State Methods with Modern Neural Architectures for Speech Applications and Beyond. Ken gets the prize for best title, uh, Better Together, Text Plus Context. Uh, Mari's team uh, responded to the explainability call, and her title at that time was Interpretability for Spoken Interactions, How Can We Use Embeddings to Explain Diarization Decisions? And last but not the least, Peter Schwartz, Automatic design of conversational models from observations of human-human conversations. So, so let me tell you briefly what these teams have done. So Lucas's team, which has about 17 people, started asking the question, well, uh, until a few years ago, speech recognition systems used to have neural front ends to analyze the acoustics, and then a finite state back end which encoded information like language models, pronunciations, dialogue states, like, you know, if, if, it's, if a dialogue system says, when would you like to fly, you're not looking for every other sentence in the world. You're looking for sentences about the date, time, relative to today, absolute. So you could bring in a lot of prior information, and FSTs, finite state transducers, are very useful to do that. But with the advent of these fully end-to-end -end neural systems, there doesn't, doesn't seem to be room to plug them back in. It, speech goes in, text comes out. So how do we bring these in? So there have been other efforts, but uh, Lucas and colleagues decided that they want to put their energies together to develop tools that can do this. And of course, they want to do this because there are issues with end-to-end -end, uh, speech recognition systems that could be addressed if you had a finite state backend. So that was the motivation behind this team. So what did they accomplish? Well, first and foremost, they developed new representations for weighted finite state transducers. You know, finite state transducers, when you draw them, when you think about them, we think of graphs, we think of nodes and edges. And if you th think as a computer scientist, you specify a graph as G equals V comma E, right? The set of vertices, set of edges, and so on and so forth. That's the usual way you think about it. Graph algorithms traverse the graph, and depth first, breadth first, all the usual, right? But there is another way to look at graphs, uh, at FSTs, which is as matrices. What do you mean? Well, graph is basically an incidence matrix. You have number of nodes times number of nodes, and every time there's an edge between node i and j, you put a number over there saying, yes, there's a node. If you, if you want a directed graph, you can either make two matrices or you can have different numbers. So there's a whole linear algebra ma applied math way of thinking about graphs. And the proposal here is that if we think of them that way, we can bring a whole bunch of techniques which are very amenable to good parallel processing, which can take advantage of things like GPUs and TPUs, because they were all optimized for matrix operations. And so the question is, can we do this? And indeed, 
uh, the team came up with a number of uh, uh, ways of doing uh, implementing FST algorithms in a parallelizable way by thinking about them as representing them as matrices. And of course, once you do that, another thing that comes for free is that there's a lot of work on automatic differentiation if you represent your computations in the form of matrix, matrix multiplication that followed by nonlinearities and so on and so forth. So as a result, a whole bunch of automatic differentiation tools were created to go with this FST operation. So that's one accomplishment. Uh, the other one is that uh, like, you know, it's not just enough to think about them and write down papers, you need to implement them. So Google had already started some work implementing these things in JAX, and uh, some other members in the team are very passionate about Julia because it has the best of both a scripting-like language but at the same time optimized and the need to perform well. So there are Julia and JAX implementations of these algorithms. Of course, most students nowadays do Python, so there are good Python interfaces, so there's a JAX to do a Python conversion. And of course, if you want things to run fast, you need to CUDAfy them, as they say, and Yenda has been CUDAfying some of these things. So you'll hear about all these things uh, when you hear uh, Lukash's team. And of course, they'll illustrate the use of FSTs by a little tiny problem saying, if you hear a sound which sounds like a word name, can you then write down a pronunciation for what you heard, and can you then use that to recognize that name again later? So there'll be an illustration of these capabilities. The other thing you'll see is, of course, these were motivated by problems. So one of the problems is that end-to-end uh, -end neural systems, the way they're trained, the way they operate, they renormalize probabilities at every stage to have probability one on all the output units. So these are called locally normalized models. And we know that they have some deficiencies. They're not good at, because they don't approximate the right posterior probabilities that you need to do quote-unquote correct decoding. So global normalization uh, or globally normalized speech lattices would be what you'd really like to have. And so once you have an FSD backend, you can start bringing those into play. And these have many applications. A straightforward one or a very obvious one is when you want to do latency-constrained ASR, you want to decode left to right. A globally normalized model does have better performance than a locally normalized one. And so you'll see some results in that space showing that this can now be done. Most of the gap, not all, but most of it is covered. Uh, <coughs> the difference between global and local normalization also is a bit more accentuated when you have this problem that uh, the team calls edge cloud trade-offs. So if you have an edge device which doesn't have a lot of compute power, you want to have just the first few layers of the network do the job, not do heavy computations. And when you're in the cloud, maybe you want to use all of them. And you want to serve a single model that has all of it. And those models, again, perform much better. If you could do some kind of global normalization, you'll hear some nice results in edge cloud computing over there. And last but not the least, an extreme form of uh, latency-constrained uh, uh, recognition uh, issues comes with long form recognition. So you imagine you have a 20, 30, 40 minute recording. So it's not like your lab experiments where you get little chunks of seven seconds of speech to recognize, it's just a whole recording. And then again, having an FST backend uh, makes it easier to work through these things, both on the training side and on the testing side. So this is what you'll hear from Lukash's team. Okay, to continue my advertisement, uh, the second team is Ken Church. Uh, Ken's team uh, uh, basically is looking at context plus text. So think about a whole collection of papers. Uh, the text would be the representation of the body of the paper, the abstract, the title, and all that. And the context would be all the papers that cite this paper or that paper. So people have looked at these for a long time. Back in the day, uh, text used to be represented using latent semantic analysis. Later on, there was the latent Dirichlet allocation with topic models. These days, everybody uses BERT or some other form of a large model to get neural embeddings for text. Same thing with graphs. You could, again, do things like SVD and have representations of that sort, or you could do graph neural networks. So Ken's team is looking at how can we take these two and create a single unified representation of documents that takes advantage of both. Why is that? Well, mainly because uh, if the way Ken puts it, if you think about documents, what it contains is what the author thinks is important, and the citations are what the audience thinks is important. So you can tell a lot about a paper by seeing who cites it or who it cites, even without looking at the content of the paper. So the kind of results you'll see from Ken, actually the first result you'll see is a gigantic database of lots of papers, carefully indexed and so on, several hundred million, a couple hundred million, I think. Th in this uh, picture that Ken gave me, there are about 100 million that have abstracts, another 100 million that are in the citation graph. By the way, information on the web is never, compl any database is never complete. So about their intersection is about 60%, so a third of the papers that have abstracts don't have citations and vice versa. So if you're trying to figure out things, if you're trying to ask the questions like, how similar are these two papers? Or these two papers are very similar, what's different about them? 
Or if I have this paper, find me similar papers and group them into groups of papers that are similar to it for different reasons. All those things require comparing papers. And if you only compare with text, you can't get some. If you compare with only citations, you can't get the other. So the idea is when you're missing values, you should try to take advantage of what's there. So you'll see a lot of re results from Ken's team on this uh, uh, theme. You'll also see results like network effects. Uh, when the graph is not very large, text representations might turn out to be quite good. But when the graph gets large, you really start seeing network effects. And the graph structure helps you find much more interesting things. And you'll see results that quantify that. Like I said, data set and a bunch of results. That's what you'll see coming out from Ken's team. The third team is uh, mm, from uh, Marie. They're working on speaker diarization So by the way, I struggled a lot with this team. I was like, what exactly are you trying to do? Right? And I think everybody in the team did too. But I can tell you what I learned from them. Right? So they're trying to explain speaker diarization. For example, which parts of the signal are most influential in a diarization, decision? So they've done things like integrated gradients, they've done phone ablation studies, they have used non-negative matrix factorization to take the representations and see which parts are relevant. They've asked questions like, does linguistic content contain speaker change information? And the answer is yes. You can do a decent job based on the transcript. And of course, these are reference transcripts. So what do you do if you don't have them? Well, you can always use an ASR system and make it aware of speaker change and use that to uh, do good diarization, or explain diarization, let's say. Uh, another question, can emotion labeling help diarization decision? explain diarization Like, you know, if, I, if the diarization goes you know, there are two speakers. So, like, you know, and so they worked on using, but to do this, you need to be able to do sentiment and emotion from short segments because you only see temporal changes. You can't take the five minute recording. So they tried to figure out how to do short segment emotion recognition. And for that, you have to take various data sets. You'll hear more about the nitty gritties from them. Uh, do other supra segmentals help decisions about explain decisions? So, if I tell you that, well, around here, there is music playing in the background, you can say, OK, that's why like, you know, maybe it didn't find the speaker change accurately. Oh, there's a noise over here. Oh, that's why it thinks it's a third speaker. So you can do things like that if you know a bit more about what else is happening in the signal. So they worked on a multi-class audio segmenter. Uh, finally, can the representation space itself be more explainable? The idea is, well, if you can binarize the space, then every speech input has some binary representation. And if you can then start correlating these bits to features of the speech, oh, this is a male speaker, this is a very quiet speaker, this is a something, something. Then you can make a diarization rhization decision based on these bits and then also look for things that correlate with that and perhaps look for explanations in that to see uh, why the decision was made the way it was. But if you do that, will you lose performance? Well, can you take a state-of-the-art diarization rhization system and make it work with these more explainable features? Turns out the answer is, yeah, kind of. You know, VBX kind of things work very well, end-to-end -end systems take time. So if you want to really understand all this, uh, just pay attention when Marie's team talks. And last but not the least, spoken dialogue. So there are lots and lots of uh, entities which have huge collections of audio recordings. And that's an opportunity. It's a gold mine. What do you do with it? Well, if you could really understand what's going on. So for example, if you take all the dialogues of a particular application, put it into this form saying, well, the person starts with looking for this, then they get asked this or that. And depending on this, this happens or that happens, something, something, and then something in the end. So this just helps you understand how these dialogues go. So just developing core understanding of how conversations go in some goal-directed setting itself is valuable. What do you do with that? Well, one thing you could do is you could build an automated system. So they've looked at how to build automated systems using these things. Another thing you could do is you could monitor if a particular conversation is going well. Because once you have a representation like this, one of the states might indicate, oh, customer is about to leave your company or your service. So watch out, bring him some help, maybe give him a bonus. So there are all sorts of things you can do once you have an understanding of dialogues. So, but the challenge, of course, is that there isn't a lot of labeled data. When, when people have such data, it's just pure speech. So they organized themselves into the structure where they said, one of our core challenges is to be able to do uh, dialogue embedding so that we can take a long dialogue, take little bits of it, and say, oh, what's happening in this dialogue over here is the same as what's happening in the other dialogue over there. Once you do that, you need to have some notion of similarity to say, oh, this bit is the same as that. So you need a similarity uh, like you know, score or metric on this embedding space. Uh, then you need to take all these to actually do dialogue structure discovery. 
And when you do all this, you need an evaluation metric. So in this field, all these things are squishy. Nothing is set, nothing is completely standard. So a lot of explanations in how to evaluate whether you've discovered good dialogue structure and so on and so forth. How to evaluate an embedding to see if it's good enough. How to evaluate a similarity score if it's giving you the kind of clusters you need and so on and so forth. And of course, all this requires data. And so they have a little data sub team and so on and so forth. So you'll hear from Petya uh, tomorrow morning and you'll hear about these. So that's what we are gonna hear in the next two days. So any questions for me? I expected they weren't. <laughs> I'm intimidating. <laughs> All right, so at this point, let me uh, stop and hand the microphone to Marie. Yeah. Can you gather in the center so the people uh, can sit? Uh... Oh, okay, <laughs> yes, everybody please move in. So hello everyone, my name is uh, Marie Taon, so I am leading the team about explainability for generalization. Um, so this is quite a huge team as Sanjeev has presented. We are uh, at least 31 participants from nine countries, so we had to manage everything uh, during these six weeks. And uh, our topic focus on generalization. So what is, the, uh, what is the, the state of the art for now in this, uh, in this field? So we know how to process multi-speaker speech signals, for example, the, those who are coming from archivists to broadcast news and so on. Uh, we know that uh, we, uh, we have some tools to make some speech segmentation to detect where there is noise, uh, the silence, or when, uh, when there is speech. We know how to make some speaker generalization to find some mono-speaker speech segments. And we also know how to make some speech transcription um, on these uh, mono-speaker segments. So what are we going to do in, uh, in, this, uh, in this experiment, in this uh, workshop? So we are going to address some very specific question uh, regarding explainability. So I'm going to go deeper in the, in the definition of this word. For example, here you have a speech signal and we have retrieved three speakers with uh, our generalization system. And we have two, two speakers, the blue and the yellow one. Uh, the system detected that they are different, so we can wonder why they are different. Is, is it reasonable to have uh, uh, different clusters for, the, for these two speakers? And probably our system can help us to investigate this question. And we can have some answers, for example, on the left it is a male, on the right it is a female. And we also know that the pitch, the fundamental frequency, will explain 70% of the decision. We can also uh, wonder why there is a boundary, so here, at the beginning of the yellow uh, speaker turn. So, this boundary is, is, is a bit problematic because so there is no time aligned transcription, but you can see that the boundary fit in the middle of a word. So why the system, the generalization system, find a boundary uh, just at this time? We, we can investigate a bit that and provide uh, some new information. For example, on the left we have no music and on the right we have music, so that can explain why the system find the boundary here. But we also uh, know that uh, there is a break in the linguistic cohesion uh, before the, the word déjà. So maybe we can wonder if this decision is correct or not, and we have to let the decision to the, to the human. Another example, we found here a very short segment for the blue speaker, 
And these very short segments have a very low confidence uh, from our system. So we can wonder if this segment needs to be clustered with the blue one or if uh, it, it is uh, not reasonable to do, so, to do so. So we investigated with this and we found that the emotional state is very high. We have a high activation for this speaker. So <coughs> we also know that uh, the loudness explains 64% of the decision. So loudness is uh, related to energy and we know that activation is uh, uh, quite correlated with loudness. So maybe this can explain why, in fact, it is really the same speaker as the blue one, but just it's a different speaker. It's a different way of speaking because it, high, it, is a, it has a high activation. So to answer all the green, the green answer, we are going to provide some different uh, tools and systems in order to investigate and to give some uh, insights of this question. So to better define what we, our uh, formal word uh, of uh, explainability, so we, we decided to split the word in three parts. The first part is the real world, so what we can hear as a human. Uh, we know that the human perception can uh, discriminate some segments, so we can say before there is music and uh, after, no, before there is no music and after there is music. We can also, as a human, say, okay, there is an, an error because it's an anom anom anomalous detection. There is something strong, uh, erroneous here. Uh, so this is our real world. Uh, when we build an automatic system, that, uh, such as, for example, speaker verification or generalization system, we are going to have a representation. So this representation is usually uninterpretable, we cannot investigate what is inside, but it is re really relevant for the system to give good performances. So we would like to investigate a little bit what is inside this representation world. Um, and we can uh, explain uh, this representation by constraining this latent space. Uh, we can also explain it by adding some probes, some gender or emotion classifier on top of it. And we can also have some perturbation mechanisms, so we can modify the input signal and see how it can change uh, the representation and how it can change the results, the performances. But we want to go further, so we are going to add another word, so the informative word. In this word, we have put a lot of things, but even a lot is not enough. Uh, so in this word, we have descriptive variables, such as uh, phonetic information, so we have phonetic alignment, word alignment, transcription. We can also have uh, topics. Uh, we can also have gender, uh, emotion, and we also retrieve some acoustic descriptors. So in this presentation, we are mainly focusing on some specific acoustic descriptors that are extracted with an uh, open smile. And these descriptors are supposed to represent the prosody, so mainly uh, intonation, energy, rhythm, and uh, spectral content. So this informative world is really important because we have experts that can interpret this kind of thing. Uh, we know, for example, uh, that uh, F0 is related to gender. We know that prosody is related to emotion. Uh, but the question is that we don't know how this word is related to the representation world. So in this workshop, we are, we are trying, we have tried to investigate how we can uh, define this linking function between the representation and the interpretation in the informative world. So this is uh, pending an open question because we didn't solve any, uh, uh, the, the problem, of course, but we are going into the, this direction. So um, regarding the organization, we have mainly three different paths. The first part is almost technical, so we would like to provide a good system that provides uh, the speaker when he speaks and how he speaks. So we pr want to provide a multitask, multimodal speech, uh, speaker generalization output. So here multimodal means that we are taking into account acoustic and linguistic information. Uh, and to do so, we have, uh, we propose a different um, system, a speech segmentation system that can output music, speech, noise, and overlap at the same time. A speaker segmentation and clustering, so generalization system. 
And also, we wanted uh, at the beginning to have topic information uh, with respect to time, but it, in fact, it's really difficult, so we didn't get into this uh, thing. Uh, and also, we would like to um, better characterize the speaker. For example, the yellow one is unknown, so we would like to characterize him. Um, so we would like to provide some attributes, for example, linguistic information, named entities, area of expertise, we can also retrieve the gender, emotion, role, overlap, etc. And we are going to uh, include also model confidence for all of that. And finally, we are going to this explainability and interpretability uh, question. So, for example, there is a speaker that says, uh, in this recording, a few years ago, you said it was me, uh, so maybe on that. Uh, but in fact, it's not me. So ca can you prove that it is really me? So we have to explain the decision of the model. So we have to explain that the blue uh, speaker is really on that and why. So why there is the boundary? So why we decided to cut this segment? Why this audio segment belongs to this speaker, the blue one? Uh, why this audio segment has been clustered with this other one? So with the other blue ones? And what are the attributes that characterize this speaker? So mainly our system will take into uh, in, in input a speech signal and also the transcription. So we can have the reference transcription, but we can also retrieve it from an automatic speech recognition system. And the global system will, will return the speech segmentation, but enriched with overlap information, music and noise. At the same time, the jarization, speaker jarization, a list of attributes and model confidence, and also the explanations. Uh, we also wanted during this workshop to provide an evaluation protocol, so we are going to set up some ideas and we uh, plan to run this protocol after the workshop. So the main the main scheme of the of the presentation will be divi divided uh, in according this uh, global scheme. So we have this entry uh, in speech. We have acoustic embeddings, so we are going to investigate this representation space. So we can segment the speech and then give the outputs to the jarization system. From this jarization system, we have mono speaker segments, so we can uh, get the gender and emotion. We also can uh, run some speaker verification and we can extract named entities and topics uh, from the linguistic information. So there are two things that I will not talk about because we didn't investigate it in details. The speaker verification system, so we have used on the shelf system, so we're not going to detail it. We are using a uh, standard X vector system. And uh, topic modeling, so also we have uh, done some work on that, but for analysis, not to develop new, new systems. And regarding explainability, so if we in integrate these uh, explainable things, we have here interpretable speaker embeddings, and we will provide explanation for all the output of the system. Okay, so I will start with the data uh, we have prepared for the workshop. Just regarding uh, the general organization, from time to time so you, will say you will see a yellow uh, stripe, a yellow flag, and this is the time for short questions, so we can take some questions at that moment. So regarding data, of course we would like to retrieve a lot of information, and at the same time we would like to train a unified a single model, but on top of different uh, annotations. So the first issue we have is that there is no uh, heterogeneity of the of the annotation across the different databases. So how you can see in this table, you have the database on the left, and there is no yes in all the columns. So it's very difficult to unify this. So, so we, ha we had to manage this kind of thing. For the evaluation data, no, so we have evaluated our, s our system on broadcast uh, data, mainly Spanish and French data, also the yard for jarization. Uh, so there we face some challenges. We have long files. We have variable speaker turn durations from very short to very long segments. We have variable number of speakers. So in Allies, for example, we have up to 74 speakers in the same uh, file. 
and in average 11 speakers, and we also have spontaneous speech. So we have made a huge work for preparing the data. Uh, so we have a, a clean evaluation test set that has been provided by Elia Data mainly. So we have only uh, 35 files for, uh, for the evaluation, but in terms of duration, it means uh, to add 10 hours. Um, we have annotation in segmentation and speaker turns plus overlap and the manual transcri transcription. We have also prepared the force alignment uh, of the phonemes and the words, so automatic force alignment, uh, in order to investigate the phonetic information. So now I, I will let the floor for low resource data. Thank you, Marie. I'm Sarah. So uh, probably this is the first time we look into this data. So this data was collected in uh, Borneo Island. Hopefully you know where is that. Uh, I have placed the Google map there. Very nice. It's quite big island. So uh, this is Sarawak Malay. It's uh, commonly spoken in the island itself, uh, pro um, mostly in the northwest of the Borneo part. So we've collected, this is one of the languages that we have collected using our web platform. We have many more. Uh, so this is the first time we are going to embark our journey on sp uh, speech recognition, speaker diarization, for this uh, particular language. But uh, the results will not be presented by me, it will be presented by uh, Zhu uh, later on. So uh, it's a conversation data. Um, as of now, we have transcribed the uh, the data uh, and also label it for speaker diarization, uh tasks. Uh, so for the transcribed data, we have about one hour and 26 minutes, 52 speakers. Uh, we have those details over there. And we have unlabeled data, which is about 12 hours uh, of the same language. So we're going to see whether uh, uh, with this under-resourced language, we will do some discovery or not on speaker diarization. We have already released the transcribed data uh, on uh, GitHub. Uh, I, I forgot to put that link there. So one of the ch uh, some of the challenges that we have in this data set is that it has been collected in various environments within the 2018 to 2022 uh, due to COVID uh, because we have uh, we work with students uh, due to uh, low resource funds. We work with students so they were at home and then they were collecting the data using their phones and so we have this kind of challenges. So you will probably listen, uh, there are some background noise. We have music, cars, bikes, maybe some chickens and also dogs at behind. So those are the kind of challenges that we see in this kind of uh, data set. But it's okay, we are, uh, we are thankful for the workshop and we learn a lot uh, along the way. So stay tuned for the first investigation on our speaker diarization, strategy for low resource language. And hold on tight, you will uh, start to see uh, our diarization, team to do their presentation. So I pass to Martin. Thank you. Uh, so I'm uh, Martin, uh, and I represent uh, the work we did on uh, multi-segmentation, uh, uh, segment, uh, multi-task segmentation. So uh, as Marie said, uh, the goal we have is to segment uh, Nogno signal uh, into four classes, uh, speech, music, noise, and overlap, uh, and maybe more if it's re uh, relevant. Uh, so what we came from, uh, we have two separate baselines. Uh, one that can do uh, overlap speech detection and uh, speech uh, segmentation at the same time, and one that, get, uh, that can separate speech, music, and noise. So now we want to fuse them. Uh, to do this, we are using the multi-label uh, paradigm, like um, uh, we can output multiple labels at the same time. So the main challenge is uh, for our work is the data. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, of classes and no data sets with uh, every one of these classes at the same time. So to do this, uh, we are using uh, uh, a method uh, to fuse uh, the partially annotated data. Uh, we are masking uh, classes in the data sets that are not present uh, to use it in the, in the same loss. So it's only possible uh, because we're using the multi-label approach. And so this method uh, is, is uh, in now implemented into Pyanot. Uh, so after the, the workshop. Uh, we tried different uh, approach, different features. First, uh, the traditional fit, uh, set of features, uh, MFCCs and, uh, and chromas, uh, and the derivative. Uh, we compared them to um, uh, leaf, uh, uh, learnable fin uh, filter banks leaf, uh, there's a, that is a, a derivative of, uh, of SyncNet that is supposed to be better for music. Uh, and uh, finally, we tried uh, the pre-trained self-supervised model. So in our case, uh, WaveLM with the base plus and the large uh, model. 
and uh, we tried different type of models. So uh, our main uh, element was the, the TCN, the temporal uh, the temporal convolution network. Uh, that's causal 1D convolution. And uh, we tried two uh, other approach. Uh, first, uh, an early fusion, look, so taking multiple features, uh, fusing them, and then going through the TCN, or uh, using different bran uh, different branches, uh, different TCN uh, for each features, and choose them uh, at the end. So on the results uh, we got uh, with the the base uh, base TCN uh, for different features, uh, we can see that uh, the wave lambda large is over uh, other other features clearly and uh, it's even at the same point uh, as the separate baseline we, we get so we basically succeed uh, into making it a, a, a single system that is as efficient as the, the separated one and uh, if we compare the the, the the alternative diffusion that we tried uh, the single uh, single branch system is still better than the, than the other so now the, we have a system that works, and uh, we might not want to know why. Uh, so to do this, uh, we tried to clusterize uh, wavelet features using a k-min, and uh, to uh, the idea was to project wavelet into a more interpretable space, like a smaller space that we could um, uh, evaluate after. And uh, we are training. Um, a classification system, a segmentation system, using uh, the clusters as uh, features. So we have two types of uh, features. Uh, either we take only the index of the, of the cluster of or the distance to every cluster. So I will only uh, speak about the, uh, the index one. Uh, it's not the best performing, but it's the more interesting. Uh, because as you can see, the results are not that bad. Clearly, uh, for the developer part, you don't even degrade. But uh, we only have one feature compared to the uh, 1024 uh, from OVLM uh, at the start. So uh, we wondered why. So maybe it's the representation of cluster that is really good. Uh, clearly not. Uh, we are looking at the, at the purity on this graph. And uh, the cluster are all mixed. Uh, we can't see any, anything on, on this side. But if we, uh, we try the second uh, experiment, by shuffling the wave LM frame uh, after the after the, exper the, the extraction, and try to, uh, to see the importance of the temporal information uh, in wave LM uh, and for the classes. And as you can see, uh, for the music, the speech, the music, and the noise, uh, it don't degrade uh, uh, as much. Uh, it don't degrade a lot. But the, for the overlap, uh, the temporal information seems to be uh, far more important uh, than the, the the dimension itself. So, uh, as, a, as, a, as a quick conclusion, uh, we presented the first segmentation model uh, as a, uh, able to provide annotation for speech overlap music and noise simultaneously uh, with competi uh, competitive performances compared to single task systems and uh, using partially annotated datasets. Uh, we can say also that the uh, segmentation seems to rely more on temporal structure of features uh, compared to the features themselves. And uh, theoretically, uh, our model can be expanded to, to more class. Okay. Um, hello, I'm uh, Alexi. Um, so now we have this um, compound data set, uh, which is made of different uh, sub data sets. And each, each of them has a different subset of classes that are annotated. And what this means is that uh, for some classes like noise and music, we have lots of hours where music and noise might be present, but we don't have any annotation on them. Uh, now, a way to deal with that is uh, with semi-supervised learning. So this is the uh, usual, like most classical setup, I think, where you have some annotated data set, some unannotated data set, which is really bigger because it's easier to, to get data than to annotate it. Um, and then you, when you sample from it on the annotated data set, you get both the input and the desired output. So in our case, the audio and the segmentation data. And for the unannotated data set, you only have the audio. Um, to deal with that, one way to do it is uh, with um, uh, teacher models. 
So in this case, you put your teacher model into some kind of pipeline, where in the end, you obtain um, an output that you use as a pseudo label, which means that you can then use it uh, in training as if it were the true label of the data. Now, in our case, the setup is a bit more convoluted because we have this compound data set, and when we sample a batch, we have a mix of presence and absence of annotation. But the idea, I think, stays the same, and that doesn't meaningfully change how it works. Now, for the experiment we did, we focused on uh, DieHard, and especially on the overlap class. Um, so DieHard is a speaker derivation data set, uh, which is made of 11 subdomains. And this means that it's, it makes a data set very um, practical, very easy to split. And what we did was split the domain in two parts. Um, which is the annotated part and the unannotated part, so split A and split B. And we, we will pretend that this split B is our unannotated data set. And so then, um, in the first phase, we can train a teacher model on the split A, which we consider as annotated. And on the second phase, we can try to train a student model um, on both split A and on split B, where we will be using pseudo labels. Uh, which are provided by uh, this teacher model. Um, and in this case, uh, the validation and test of split B, um, we use uh, the true labels, uh, because what we want to do is really uh, see how the training goes. Um, now, how to select pseudo labels, because we probably do not want to use uh, all the pseudo labels generated by the model, because some of them will be good, some of them will be bad. So if we look a bit closer to the output of our model, we have this segmentation output, and it's the end output, and this is what is desired for the user. Uh, but if we look before the binarization threshold, we have these row posteriors, uh, which represent some kind of quote-unquote probability of the class. So if you get 0 0.8, you might expect that there is uh, about an 80% an chance that the class C is present, and then 20% chance that the class C is absent. Now, of course, uh, there is no mathematical certainty behind that. Uh, models do not have to follow this. But we will assume that these posteriors can be um, taken as some kind of proxy for this probability. And from this, we can also derive some notion of confidence. Uh, in the same, it's a bit uh, blurry uh, what is confidence in this case. But we can assume that uh, if the model uh, outputs uh, extreme results, like very close to one or very close to zero, it's probably more confident than if it outputs uh, something that's more in the middle. And now, what kind of strategies can we use to select these pseudo labels given this confidence? So to visualize that, uh, let's have a batch that we have sorted from the least confident samples to the most confident samples, so sample data where the model is least confident sample data where the model is most confident. The first strategy will be to first select samples where the model is the most confident. Second strategy is to first sample uh, data where the model is the least confident. And first strategy is to sample um, data between two quantiles of confidence, so taking a slice of uh, data. Um, now, a uh, bit of a tangential question is, what if we could actually annotate some of the data in split B? So if we annotate 0% of the data, we just get our baseline. We haven't done anything. Uh, if we annotate all of it, this is probably our top line, because then it's just fully supervised learning. Um, but then if we annotate some arbitrary percent between 0 and 100%, uh, uh, we have different strategies to do so. Uh, so first, our, our first strategy, which is to annotate using, um, like providing the labels where the model is uh, the most confident first, we get a fairly linear improvement in performance. If we use a strategy three, we get fairly linear decrease in performance. And most importantly, if we use a strategy two, so if we select uh, the least confident data first to provide labels on it, we get a really big improvement in uh, in performance very quickly with a very low amount of data. So if we if here we provide only 10% um, of the data, but where the model is very confident, and we uh, almost manage to reach the same performance as if we provided 
uh, all of the data. Now, uh, what will happen if we actually try to do some misfire learning, so with uh, pseudo labels? Uh, this is the kind of uh, thing we were expecting, where with the green curve we have um, no improvement when we use 0% uh, of the pseudo labels. We probably don't have uh, much of an improvement, or maybe it will degrade if we use all of the pseudo labels, because then you use a mix of um, data that is correct and incorrect. And at some point in the middle, with some kind of strategy, we should have some peak. Uh, now, our intuition was maybe a bit incorrect because this is what we got. Um, and the first thing you can see is this uh, big, big uh, dip in performance at the middle. And this is where um, the output of the model is neither really confident, neither really unconfident. Uh, and the best results are obtained on, um, when selecting data where the model is between 30 and 40 percent of confidence. Now, these results are a bit uh, strange, and I think that can be attributed to multiple factors. First, we are not using any augmentation, and I think that's actually a key part for semi supervised learning, and we can't expect really a big uh, and consistent improvement in performance without that. The second point is that uh, our data comes from different distribution because we are using diehard, and what we, are trying to, what we are trying to do is both semi-supervised learning and domain adaptation, so we are making the task uh, even harder. Uh, and then we use uncalibrated posteriors. Um, so because we have no guarantee about the calibration of our model, about what these posteriors are supposed to represent, um, we can't really use any fancy uh, or reliable selection strategy and we are mostly forced to use um, quantiles. But if we had uh, calibrated posteriors, we could use probably better uh, strategies. Uh, the second point is that um, where the model is very confident, it is actually um, good enough. Uh, what I mean by that is that if you provide annotation here, it will not uh, increase the quality of the model. Uh, but these uh, predictions are very variable because uh, this means that the model is mostly right here and uh, they can then be used in augmentation schemes for semi supervised learning. Uh, and finally, uh, if, he, if we look at the data where the model is uh, not very confident at all, uh, this is where probably the decision boundary is not clear for the model. And if we provide samples of data here, uh, we can probably help the model uh, a lot to improve its performance. Hi, my name is Jasmine. I will be talking about calibration in the context of Alexis experiments. Um, well, we will say a probabilistic classifier is calibrated if it generates scores that match the frequency of the classes given those scores. We want these calibrated scores because we want them to be interpretable and because we want to take optimal base, base, base decisions. And we suppose this will be beneficial for the pseudo labeling context. In our experiments, we work with post hoc calibration in a post hoc calibration fashion, where we take our raw scores, find a calibration transformation to obtain calibrated scores, and then compare the original and the calibrated scores. And we measure calibration in terms of expected calibration error, which is kind of like the new standard metric for calibration in the machine learning community, and a calibration loss that is the difference between the log loss in the raw scores and in the calibrated scores. <laughs> Our question is like, we want to analyze the performance of the model on seen and unseen domains. Um, Alexi already explained the composition of diehard, so we will consider the one and two, the five domains in diehard as seen. We will train the model and train the calibrator on those domains and we will test on domains from the 1 to the 11. This means that we will be testing on seen and unseen domains. Concretely, our experiment on calibration will consist on taking Alexis teacher model, training a linear logistic regression with the, the domains from the 1 to the 5 to obtain the calibration parameters with, with which we will transform our scores and calibrate the complete test sets test set from domains D1 to 11 as kind of like as it comes. But when we diagnose the calibration of our model, this is a reliability diagram that shows in the x-axis the bin posteriors of the model 
and on the y-axis the frequency of the positive class in each of the bins, we see that the, the model, because everything lies on the, the blue bars lies on the, lie on the diagonal, we see that the model globally is kind of like <laughs> perfectly calibrated, or more or less. And we also see that from expected calibration error and our calibration loss. So, but however, when we see like the calibration, when we start analyzing the calibration by domain and we s do an analysis from D1 to D11, we see that calibration varies a lot within the domains. It has better performance as we would expect in the domains during, dur seen during training and worse one in the domains not seen during training. And which, which makes us think that probably an, uh, only w selecting only one threshold for the entire data won't be useful. That reliability diagram shows as an example, for example, domain D7, which is highly uncalibrated. And also another thing that we saw is that probably domain mismatch affects more calibration than classification from what we can see from the equal error rate values, but I chose equal error rate, but there was lots of other metrics. So this I will skip. And these are the, the conclusions for the whole group. <laughs> so uh, for the multitask segmentation group, some takeaways. Uh, first, uh, we are able to create a, a grid model that can segment another signal into four classes simultaneously and output calibrated score. Uh, and we propose also uh, a framework to, partially, uh, to use partially, partially annotated data. Uh, we raised, uh, thanks to Rasmin and, um, and Alexi, uh, the issue of global calibration uh, against in-domain calibration. And uh, we demonstrated the importance of temporal information in pretend features. And for future works, uh, we want to demonstrate that it's possible to extend uh, our model to new classes and out of domain data uh, with calibration. So if you have some questions, uh, now is the time. So we can continue. Okay. Mm. So, hello, my name is Anya, and as was said before, the diarization is actually the core component of uh, the whole team. So here, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the work done by the diarization sub subteam of our team. And first, I would like to maybe remind you very shortly what the diarization is. So what do we expect from the diarization system is that it, for a given audio file, it's supposed to tell us how many speakers do appear in the file and when do they speak. And there are two general directions that people usually take when addressing this problem. Either this would be the clustering-based approaches, as, for example, our baselines are, uh, which are agglomerative hierarchical clustering and VBX, but I'm not going to describe them since I already did it here once. And um, in this kind of approaches, you assume that, or uh, the way you proceed is you split the given audio file into short overlapping segments, you extract some speaker embedding from each of the seg uh, segments, and then you try to cluster the speaker embeddings. And for many clustering methods, it's uh, relatively easy to track why you decided to cluster two embeddings together. So from explainability point of view, it's a like, nice feature of this mm, model. However, the typical embeddings that we have here are not explainable, so uh, this is a drawback of this approach, but if we manage to replace the embeddings by some interpretable ones, then we can say that this is already good enough explainable derivation. And another general approach that is taken and emerging now is the end-to-end -end diarization, system where you have uh, 
your audio file as an input to some black box neural network, which is supposed to give you the solution for the whole diarization problem at once. And uh, yeah, uh, the, this neural network generally is not explainable um, bec um, because even we can extract some internal representations from it, but we don't know what they mean. But we can try to make it more transparent, let's say, uh, by trying to induce some information which we think is meaningful and worth uh, kind of, for the model would be good to model and uh, you will see in shortly how we approach it. And uh, this, if, if we manage to uh, inject some internal structure into the model, then we can try to um, interpret the, inter uh, the internal presentation from it afterwards. And here I will just quickly show you the baseline results for the diarization systems that we started with. These are uh, agglomerative clustering, as I said, and VBX. And here the results are for two use cases. One's where we use the Oracle voice activity detection or the other one when we get the output from the segmentation team and uh, this is our output. And uh, from the numbers, what we can see here, we tested it on both diehard and allies, is that uh, first of all, the VBX seem to be outperforming AHC. Uh, for both of the systems. But uh, what is interesting is that maybe our voice activity detection is uh, a little bit biased towards allies because we don't see that much degradation in the performance for this data set, while for diehard the degradation is very high. And uh, what I want to point out here is that all of the systems that all of the clustering based systems that you are going to see would be using Oracle VAD. So uh, this is kind of the baseline uh, for us. And uh, also in this case, all of the models are trained on Voxelab 2. And uh, this is the case for all of the diarization systems that you are going to see now. And uh, I will pass the floor to Pauling who will um, introduce another clustering based uh, diarization approach. Okay, thank you, Anya. Um, I I'm Paula, and uh, I will present uh, what we did during the workshop uh, using a graph neural network to for the realization. And um, as you can see in this picture, we are dealing with uh, acoustic uh, signal. So, uh, as uh, oh, sorry. Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I think so. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So here you have the, the acoustic signal, and uh, as explained by uh, Anya, we will use a sliding window to extract the, the, the segment. And this segment, from, from this segment, we extract the embedding. And the uh, embedding will, will be used to, uh, to, 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 to build the graph. Here, each embedding will represent uh, a node. And we will use some similarity matrix to define the edges be between the um, between the, the node, uh, using, for example, a threshold to remove some some um, um, uninteresting uh, edges. And the, the the GNN model will try to uh, identify the cross the cluster in this graph, and uh, will assign at the end of the the, the, this, the process um, an ID or a label to each uh, cluster. And these. ID or, or label will be used to, uh, to, to, to provide the output of the realization uh, system. So we have used uh, this GNN model to, uh, with, uh, with two goals the, during the, the workshop. The first one is to compare the result uh, of this model to the other realization approaches used by the group and to look at uh, some uh, postdoc explanation of how the, 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 the clustering step are, um, are implemented or um, um, processes by the, by the GNN. Uh, one I want to, 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 I want to point out that uh, graph, uh, we know that graph are pretty tool to represent the relation between object and here uh, we can see that uh, in our case we have just used uh, x vector as uh, to define uh, the node, but we can add any kind of information in this node. For example, we can add uh, some linguistic feature, we can add some uh, temporality feature, and define some distances that would be used to um, to uh, to build or to add to to generate the the edges. So. Um, 
it's very intuitive. Uh, it's very intuitive to build the graph using uh, these approaches and use the, um, the graph in the GNN model. Um, again, the same. <laughs> what is the problem here? Oh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's so easy to use this. Okay. Uh, we, have, we, we use a model um, proposed uh, two, years, two years ago by some guys of, uh, of uh, Amazon, and they have used uh, GNN, the GNN model to cross to for, for clustering of uh, for clustering images, as you can see in the first picture. We have images, and they just build a, uh, they generate a similarity matrix use cosine distance, and uh, from the cosine distance matrix, they build a, uh, they use Kanyan Kanyan's uh, root to build the, f the initial graph. And this graph is trained using uh, uh, GNN called here, uh, uh, Lenders, and Lenda is a graph convolutional neural network. And uh, by, by aggregating some node in the first graph, they will generate uh, uh, the, the, the graph in the next level, and then they will train the, the, the model uh, hierarchically till the, half, uh, the last graph, uh, they get the last graph with uh, no more edges. And the ID or the label uh, assigned to the node in the last graph will be backpropagated on the to um, in the process in the um, in the different graph to uh, get the ID of uh, the initial graph. And this ID will uh, be considered as the 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 the, the label of or the yes or, or the name of the of uh, or the the, the, the identify the, the identifier of each uh, each uh, person in the, the first image. So what we did is just to replace the um, the input of the the model by uh, x vector, and then define some similarity matrix using uh, we can use uh, any kind of distance between uh, between this x vector as similarity matrix, and we have trained the model that this uh, hierarchical graph convolutional neural network for uh, the for the dualization. So, um, uh, for an experiment, we have uh, used Diehard and uh, Allies, and uh, we have trained uh, the, mo the, the model with uh, three setup of the voxel app. Uh, the first one is we have used all the voxel app to the um, uh, embedding to generate the initial graph and then train it. Uh, the second uh, setup is uh, we have split the, um, uh, the, the voxel app uh, data or used by uh, some file using uh, 300 speakers per, 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 per graph, and uh, in the last setup we have used a uh, file with uh, 30 speakers uh, per graph. And uh, there are many hyperparameters in, uh, in this model. The first one is k, k the, num the k used to build the, the, in the, the KNN graph, l the number of level, the number of level in the hierarchical graph neural network, uh, the number of convolution in the GNN, and the, the, uh, the graph attention. If we we can set uh, the graph attention uh, network, we can say we want to use the GPU and CPU. But we are focused on two parameters: k the um, used to build the, CN, the, the KNN and L, the number of level in the, um, in the, in the GNN. And we found that uh, this model is very sensitive to the parameter key. And uh, as you can see in the table, uh, the results are not so bad uh, compared to the, the VBX base baseline. And if you can see in the last, uh, the last setup, uh, give the most impro the, the, the better result because the number of speakers in each graph is close to the number of speakers in the, in the test, uh, test set. Um, uh, the, the one conclusion, the main conclusion on, um, for this task is, or for this part of the work is uh, that G GNN model, can uh, clustering based model, uh, can be uh, a good alternative when the um, explainability is concerned because uh, graphs are really uh, intuitive. We can anybody can build graph uh, according what he wants to, uh, to 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 represent or to design. And um, there are some, uh, there nowadays there are some uh, models proposed to uh, explain the, the GNN. And these models uh, are uh, use uh, some perturbation in the graph structure, and we know that perturbation in graph structure is really intuitive also. also. So for the conclusion, we'll say that GNN hierarchical uh, clustering provide competitive realization uh, result. In future, we uh, plan to, con to combine 
the linguistic information with acoustic information, for example, by using uh, what will be presented in the next section by Fetia and his colleague when they align, uh, they, 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 they extract some alignment between text and, uh, and uh, acoustic uh, signal. And we, uh, adding temporary information still has to be, uh, to be explored. Thank you. I will pass the floor to uh, Victoria. Thank you, Poland. Hello, everyone. So now, as uh, the beginning Anya presented, there are another stream of research nowadays, apart from the traditional approaches for speaker diarization that is uh, becoming increasingly relevant, and these are the end-to-end -end, uh, models for speaker diarization So this kind of approach uh, consists of uh, training only a single uh, model uh, to solve the, which solves the complete diarization task. This uh, kind of models has another advantage that is there is no need of uh, external BAD or an overlap uh, detector uh, because the system uh, implicitly takes uh, care of the of this information. But, uh, however, uh, these models also have uh, several disadvantages, like uh, they require a large amount of training data to be able to, to train it correctly, and this kind of data usually is simulated. And also, when we want to evaluate this kind of system, uh, um, they usually suffer when we use uh, long files. So in the literature nowadays, people usually evaluate it chunking on source segments and then applying a clustering technique. And also, as you know, in all the fields, uh, usually end-to-end -end models are black boxes, difficult to explain. So uh, here, uh, we want to improve uh, these end-to-end -end models to encourage uh, the internal uh, representations to be, be, to be meaningful and obtain uh, other kind of information from it. So we, here we have a work on two uh, research streams to do this, uh, this approach. That uh, there are uh, both are here, the end-to-end -end model plus phoneme loss and the end-to-end -end model plus speaker loss. And uh, in the future, these, uh, these two lines could be of approaches could be joined in the future if we consider that which uh, could help one uh, each other. So I'm going to explain both. First, uh, the end-to-end -end model plus uh, phoneme loss. So in the, in the current end-to-end -end model, uh, we, don't, we didn't know if there is some uh, phoneme information inside of the embeddings in that comes from the transformer encoder. So we thought that it was interesting to, to know if there is some information inside. And also, if this, uh, if this information is inside in the end-to-end -end models, if it's helping for the diarization task or not. And then, if, if we check it that, uh, we decide if we push the model to encourage uh, this phoneme uh, information, or it's better to remove this information and push the encoder uh, far away from it to keep uh, more space in the embeddings for other relevant information. Mm, but uh, with this, uh, a few days ago, we have some technical and data issues, so we can't show here uh, some results about this. But uh, we are in progress, we're progressing the, with this, so we, we hope we will soon uh, have some results. So. In the second approach that uh, we are we were working here is the including instead of the phoneme loss the speaker loss for incorrect uh, the internal representations. So uh, also uh, as the it's the same as happened with the phoneme information in the end to end uh, in the current end to end models uh, we don't know if the where we know that there is not good speaker representations uh, inside so to use for uh, verification task or others. So uh, we decide to try to encourage these internal representations to be ma mainful and also containing more speaker information and also, for example, to improve the ability to discriminate the uh, same speaker between different um, uh, shows or files. For to, do, to, to carry out this uh, experiment, we, this approach, we, we, uh, we introduced two different uh, uh, strategies. First, we introduced the speaker loss at frame level as we can see here. Uh, so we introduce a linear layer plus a, speaker, a cross entropy speaker loss, the typical one. And the second one, uh, that uh, maybe is more is, uh, and smartest uh, strategy, we introduce the speaker loss at a track level. 
eh, these attractors are uh, trained during the diarization uh, well, the, where the diarization system is trained to to calculate the number of speakers that uh, they are present in the in the conversation. So if we put uh, this uh, extra speaker loss, we can see which attractor corresponds with uh, each embedding, each speaker. Sorry, but uh, mapping the speaker label, but it, it has also a disadvantage because it's uh, mapping the speaker labels to know the corresponds with each attractor is also mm, more complicated to manage inside of the system. But we we manage it. So uh, uh, also, as I mentioned, uh, there an important point to train correctly these kind of systems is the data that you use to train. So for this work, in this workshop, we simulated uh, some conversation of only two speakers using VoxTelep. So we simulated around uh, more, more than 2,000 hours to train these kind of systems. So uh, first, bef uh, before to go to the diarization station results itself, uh, I want to present the, an analysis that we did with the validation set of this uh, simulated conversation uh, that uh, we generated. And which uh, I'm going to show you the uh, a representation of the cosine similarity of two segments of the conversations. W uh, these two segments of conversation has one speaker shared between them. And also we did a speaker, uh, we prepared a protocol of a speaker verification to evaluate in terms of equal error rate. So now you are going to understand. So here uh, we can see the cosine similarity matrix. For people who is less familiar with this kind of representation, this first square is, uh, corresponds to the embeddings of the first conversation comparing uh, all embeddings between them. And this second square here is the same for the second conversation. So uh, in these uh, two conversations, uh, we can see that inside, uh, more or less, the terms of the speaker, speakers speaking is uh, the system could manage and separate them. But uh, we also wanted to notice here that the speaker C is not present in the first conversation. So this, uh, I, I forgot, uh, the more yellow is the higher similarity. So we want to that speaker uh, be, um, these representations will be uh, lower uh, similarity with the, these ones. But in this case, as you see, they are higher. But is this, was, well, this representation was with the end-to-end -end model, but if now include, we include the speaker loss, we can see that uh, the internal separation of the speakers uh, more or less is key, but in this case, we achieve that the system has learned to discriminate that this speaker is not present in the first uh, conversation. We also wanted to see more yellow this part because this speaker A is present here, but well, it's uh, an initial experiment, so initial experiment, so we, we, we could improve it, I guess. And also, as I mentioned, we ran the, the verification protocol to, with the whole uh, validation set to see this in a quantitative uh, measure. So we, we can see the, in terms of equal error rate that with the first the end to end model without the speaker loss we have uh, uh, more than the double of the of the value than with the end to end plus speaker loss it's a high value but uh, it's a promising uh, result to to continue working on that and now uh, the, we evaluated these end to end systems also using the those two of the typical uh, uh, data sets for diarization, what uh, the diehard that, as my colleagues mentioned, has 11 different domains. And an important thing that for the future results is they have six domains with conversation between one to three speakers. And also we evaluated in a nice clean test, uh, with ha which has 35 files, seven files with conversation of three to four speakers, 17 files with conversation of two uh, to 10 speakers, and 11 files with conversation of more than 10 speakers. So now I'm going to show you the results uh, here. As you can see, uh, we are uh, far from the state of the art or the results that our, my colleagues uh, presented, but uh, we, we want to see that uh, including this speaker loss, we keep the same, res the same or, or uh, at least the same uh, diarization station error that the end-to-end -end without this is loss, that is our baseline. And also I want to do some remarks about these results, because I want to say that, as I already mentioned, this um, 
system was trained uh, without any fine tuning, so with, uh, with the box lab simulated conversation data. Uh, and evaluated and on, on, uh, another advantage of this kind of model is that we could uh, evaluate it using uh, the end-to-end -end model directly, things that in just say is possible, that in other clusters is not possible, even with the long files without any, of, uh, any chunking. And two important issues to remark is the domain mismatch between this uh, evaluation data with the training data, and also the most important for me, I think, is the model during the training is only seen data with two speakers in the conversation. So it's difficult with the files on with more than uh, 10 speakers to, to do it correctly. So we did a deeper analysis, just focusing in the domains with uh, the most similar uh, amount of speakers that we used to train. So we, here we can see the diehard domains with one to three speakers. And uh, we, uh, we also observe that the results are in, improved in almost all the cases when we introduce this speaker loss to the end-to-end, -end, especially in the case of the attractor level. So it's in, and also in some cases, it's a huge improvement. So it's, uh, it's the thing that we, we want also. And also in allies with three, two, four speakers or seven files, uh, we have also see the same trend. So we are improving the addition the performance in these uh, files. So we are still far from the uh, good result, but this is promising. And as I did it previously, uh, I, I put here to finalize two representations. This one is uh, two files of allies with uh, uh, two conversations of the three speakers. And we can see that with the end-to-end -end model, uh, uh, the system is not able to, to discriminate bet between both conversations. But uh, when we included this uh, speaker loss, well, we are far from saying the, that the same speaker is present in both, but we can see uh, how the system is able to discriminate better between both conversations. So to conclude, uh, well, the to conclude this, uh, this part of the presentation, uh, we, we will see that it's too hard to manage and train these kind of models. Uh, but also we, we achieved to encourage internal representations uh, to be more meaningful, uh, containing more, more or extra speaker and information. And for the future work, uh, we, well, we will plan to follow with this and train the end-to-end -end models using conversation data with more than two speakers. And also we, ca we could um, fine tune the train models with domain data and also try different alternatives for the new losses on the architectures included. So now I'm going to give the floor to my colleague to present the low resources uh, diarization station. Thank you, Victoria. Hello, now I will be uh, presenting to you the investigation that I've done on the speaker, the speaker diarization realization strategy for low resource language. In this case, it's the Sarawak Malay data, which was presented by Dr. Sarah earlier. The, appro the approach in particular that is, there is used for this investigation is using auto-labeled data set as training data, as in the 237 auto-labeled data earlier. So the, the process is quite simple. Uh, first, we and firstly, we obtain the baseline of peer node on transcribed raw Malay data. Uh, so we we take the peer node model the, or the p train x vector model. We uh, perform the evaluation. Uh, I mean, evaluation on the 37 test data, and then we we use the manually annotated UEM and RTTM to evaluate the diarization in error rate or the DER, which is 15.0 to 5%. And this is, uh, this is already good, but can we improve it even more? We'll see. And the next step is to fine tune the pre-trained pre X, uh, X, X vector model or the piano model. So uh, the process is basically, the, the, to get the DER for the process is basically the same as you want to get the baseline earlier, but the difference is, before uh, before we get to the evaluation of the model, we fine tune it first by using the train set. And how we get this train set is by by we have the 237 audio data which we use for training, but it's unlabeled. So how we are, how do we do auto labeling is we use Pyonote. We put in the 237 audio files to get the RTTM, and then with this RTTM we generate the UEMs. Then we have the entire train set right here. It's all auto-labeled automatically. 
And then we use it for to fine tune the pre-trained expector model, the piano model. And after that, after it's been pre-trained, then we do evaluation on the same uh, test set that we used to get the baseline earlier to, to, to see the, the performance. Then we'll get the diarization rise error rates. Uh, for the for the sake of investigation, I uh, separate the the training data. Not really separate, but more like I sequential sequentially add, uh, add more and more of it. At first, I start with only twenty percent of the uh, training data. Then I do a fine tuning and evaluate. But then I re uh, but then I repeat the process again with forty percent and then sixty percent, eighty percent, and hundred percent. And this is the the results that I, that that, uh, that was achieved. And as you can clearly see there, the baseline 15.03 or 15.025 with 20%, and it gradually gets lower and lower, which proves the hypothesis, hyp the hypothesis to be correct that the, the amount of training data that we put, the, the, the size of the training set does improve the terrorization performance. So the R gets lower and lower. Now the conclusions that I have for, for this is that uh, as, as I mentioned just now, the size of training data affects the diarization rhization performance because the diarization error rate gets lower and lower. And the next one, the unlabeled data can be used for fine tuning without having to do any manual annotation because the manual annotation is only done on the 37 test set and it was uh, already long been, uh, the ground truth already long been obtained. The, on the 237, it's all fully automated, the RTTM and the UEM. So because of this, it opens for more, it opens more uh, opportunities for uh, to look into the unlabeled data side. How, how can we use it even more for uh, improving diarization rhization? So that's why the future work is to, one of it is to investigate pseudo labeling, the concatenation of Sarawak Malay species data. This idea is given to me by Sanjeev. And that's for uh, uh, and also the unlabeled data, the thing about the 237 unlabeled data, that's only for one language, the Sarawak Malay. I use that, uh, that language in particular because, because the test set, we tested on a Sarawak Malay to, to evaluate. But what if we use other languages? Do we get, do you also, does it also improve the diarization? We'll see, because in the website where, where I'm getting all the Sarawak Malay data set, there, uh, there's a lot of languages, not only Sarawak Malay, but many others, and there's thousands of them. And other than that, the more lab more labeled data will also be coming in soon. So, in a way, I can uh, I can uh, compare. Is it really better to use unlabeled? But what if what if I use uh, labeled data as well? Will it improve the performance even better than unlabeled does? Now for the takeaway for the diarization rhization team, is it possible to build an explainable and well-performing diarization rhization system? And as the, they presented earlier, two approaches are, the two approaches are to, firstly, to change the input of exi existing diarrhization to a more interpretable one, or just modify the approach altogether. And other than that, the clustering baseline approaches perform the best, even with interpretable input embeddings, and this will be shown later. And this is uh, this this is good in both performance and explainability. And the third takeaway is the e, the e, e and D models are difficult to train and experiment with, and they also are time consuming from what I heard. But there is a good indication that with uh, additional information injected in the model, they get better in performance and explainability. So for me, any questions? So I guess this question may be for Victoria. I don't know who it's for. If you could go back to the slides where you put this uh, uh, speaker. Yeah, any one of them is good. Yeah, yeah, this one's fine. Or maybe actually go to the another one which had three speakers, A, B, C. Yeah, this one, right? So it looks like by adding the speaker loss, you're hoping to improve finding of speakers across conversations. 
but what you seem to be accomplishing is rejecting any match between conversations. In other words, you managed to dis make it easy to see that C is not present in the first conversation, but you didn't really, you also managed to hide A between the two conversations. So in some sense, looks like what this is doing is it is helping you reject matches across conversations and not really find speakers across conversation. Is that a fair criticism of this result? No, well, but one thing that we saw that we are rejecting the speakers uh, when we want to increase also the mm. to find one in the other conversation. So that's one also the problem though, that uh, we have this higher equal error rate because are, we are missing the positive uh, 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 speakers in the conversation. Yeah. So it's a thing that we, ha we have to, to try to investigate and improve it. They also remove ones and keep the other ones. Right. So I wonder if rather than using something like binary cross entropy to say this is the same speaker, whether you need to have some kind of ternary thing where you say this is the same speaker in the same conversation, this is the same speaker but in a different conversation. We are using a multi-class cross entropy, so it's not binary. So it's a... a oh, whatever, like, you know, whatever you use, all I'm saying is you're telling the system that on the top right box, the speaker in the first conversation and the speaker in the second conversation are the same, right? And in the bottom right box, you're also saying the same thing. This is the same speaker. Yes. What I'm saying is those could be two different targets. Oh, well. Saying this, in other words, instead of saying same speaker versus not same speaker, you have not same speaker, same speaker in the same conversation, same speaker across conversations. Yes. Because there might be some effects which need to be discovered specifically across conversations. Yes. It, it would be nice to have two different labels with, for the same speaker, one in the yeah. same conversation and another in, right. yes, you are right. Thank you guys for very nice presentations. Actually, this is a question to uh, Pauline, or Pauline, sorry. Uh, about the GNNs, so your your states in the network were just uh, attributed to single speakers, or can you also work with overlaps uh, of speakers in in your uh, analysis? And if not now, are there any prospects to work with overlaps in the future? Um, in this, in the model, we are, we are using uh, overlapping in the. Um, uh, Yes, we can extract. We, we can use overlapping segments because we are just using a sliding window and extract. Uh, and building. it means that, uh, for example, if we have two nodes representing um, one, for example, the, the non-overlapping part and another node with overlapping part, the, the distance will be low compared to the distance of two embedding from the for the same speaker. So uh, this this is this, uh, the edges are weighted in, this, in the graph. So we can use this information for to infer some. Uh, I don't know if... Uh, okay, but did yeah. have, have you done it so far? Or, or, or is it just the pure speakers and this is just a planned work? Or was it already done? Yes, it was already done in the... Okay, in this okay, case, okay, yeah. okay, thank yeah. you. For the, for the test, for, for the test data. In the test data. I, thank you. I have one more question, if I can. This is more for, for the beginning part, for the feature extraction. I, I think it was for you, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the name. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yes, the guy, the, the strict... Uh, uh, T-shirt. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, no, for the guy sitting here. Yeah. So, so sorry. I should learn the names. Uh, it was about the energy features. So ba basically, this this can be very uh, crucial for determining like who is this uh, more louder speaker and softer speaker and so on. And you said uh, that you are using the deltas or derivatives of uh, energy. But then you can do lots of different normalizations, like before it, after it, uh, global, local, speaker-based one, whatever. So what, what is the best practices to do uh, normalization in the determination of energy for, for this task? So uh, we didn't, uh, in our group on the features, we didn't work on the speaker, uh, uh, on diarization, we, we wanted to, to get speech, not to discriminate uh, speakers uh, against one uh, one against each other, except in the in the, in the overlap part. Um, but uh, what we used uh, are where baseline uh, the the, the acoustic features we uh, we were using. Uh, mainly, we were removing the energy uh, from the MFCCs, so the the first one, the first uh, the first component. 
uh, as for for the yeah, at least for the other, for the other parts. Uh, the other pa the other MFCCs are, uh, were more more discriminative. Okay, but then I, I think someone mentioned using the energy and not the not not, not the base one, but 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 the derivative of the energy. So I just wondered, like, what what was the normalization <coughs> deployed? But uh, maybe it was not you, but uh, but, but the speaker <laughs> that spoke before you. I, I I'm really sorry, I don't remember. Energy. But maybe we can take it offline. Actually, yeah. if it yeah. is yeah. Not, not clear, I'm not gonna delay the whole show. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All right. So good morning, everyone. Yeah. Uh, Roger Moore is uh, saying that he's quite confused about what would constitute a good explanation for the aerization, given that the aerization is itself an explanation of an audio stream. So, y yes, of course, uh, the aerization gives some. Um, some segmentation, so you have the boundaries and you have the speaker IDs, but you don't know why the system, the generalization system, has put this boundary here. Neither why did it cluster two speaker, two segments as the same speaker. So we can extract from the generalization system some information to explain the decision, but that's why what we are investigating in the in the project, in fact. I hope it answered to the question. Yeah. All right, so good morning, everyone. I'm Swaila. Uh, we are from the speaker change detection from linguistic transcriptions. Yeah, okay. All right, so uh, the goal here is uh, to uh, detect the speaker change, and then another uh, keyword is from the linguistic transcriptions. All right, so. Uh, <laughs> To answer uh, to answer these questions, uh, can linguistic information help to explain speakerization? So these are our uh, questions, main questions in the team. And then to answer these questions, we are applying. Uh, we have applied to two approaches. The first one is mainly on the motivation itself. Is this uh, the output from this motivation could lead to the to the next steps in uh, step, step step two and the step three, whereby the step two is mainly to predict the speaker change using the transcriptions. And then the transcription here is mainly on the reference and hypothesis. And then the following, uh, the follows uh, steps uh, would be the integrate, uh, how we can integrate the speaker change information in ASR training. So the motivation here is uh, to investigate the relationships of the speaker distributions uh, versus lexical contents uh, in the French broadcast news uh, is uh, limited to the spare allies data. All right, so how did we uh, come up with this? Uh, we, do the, we, did, we did this investigation is uh, from the identifying the speaker of, the se of each segment uh, using a clustering. And then from the clustering, we observed the patterns uh, from the speaker clustering uh, based on the semantic understanding. So this is the pipeline that we uh, went through, whereby for uh, in this pipeline, we are applying the translation text. And then for this translation text, we're using uh, reference data and also the ASR hypothesis, uh, these two types. And then we went through the segment, uh, sentence, segment embedding, sorry. And then uh, for the segment uh, embedding, we're using transformer based learning. And we go through the clustering. For the clustering part, we're applying uh, to a uh, hybrid approach, we could say a, a hybrid approach, whereby we're using the bird topic here and the k-means. The purpose of using the bird topic is, this is mainly on the topic, mainly just, just applying, uh, is to get the, the idea of the similarity context in, uh, from the segments. And also, we did the clustering using the k-means here. And uh, from uh, the pipeline, okay, we obtain uh, this result so called this result and then based on the two scenarios the first scenario is uh, based on the one show so to answer this one i mean in one show is the purpose is to to see which speaker occurs more than one time uh, during one show to see if there's any overlapping speakers and then uh, if you can see from this plotted graph the okay, the dotted colors is uh, re representing the the speaker the speaker ID, and then uh, from these two plotted graphs, it shows that there's a similarity okay, between these two graphs, whereby uh, from these two clusters, speaker one and speaker two is like 
so-called like to call, I mean, uh, dominant in the cluster, similar to the from the ASI hypothesis, whereby these two speakers, also the same speakers, are uh, dominant. I mean, in the, the in the clusters. All right, and then in the next scenario, whereby this is mainly on the merged shows, mean to say more than one shows. Okay, we're trying to uh, look into who uh, who spoke more or uh, who spoke in a similar context. So in the similar context here, we didn't go deeply into the uh, linguistic uh, part. I mean, a deeper part of the linguistic level, but we look onto the similar uh, context of the. Uh, based on the segment discussed. So here, from the reference data that we have, okay, uh, it clustered, uh, three clusters, produced three clusters, and then from the ASI hypothesis, it produced five clusters here. So there's a, a difference here, we, can, we could see there's a difference here because in the ASI hypothesis, there might be one, there's a possibility of one segment didn't been decoded, uh, it's not been decoded compared to the one segment in the reference data. So this is what we could see from these uh, observations. And then from here as well, we could see that there's, there's a possibility of the speaker change occurs uh, based on this uh, scenario. So uh, based on that one, uh, we, based on this investigation, so uh, we proceed with the next steps whereby we're trying to get the speaker change detections using the transcriptions and then the next, uh, the next method. So I pass the floor to Tian Ping. Hello, good morning, everyone. Okay, uh, I will discuss our uh, our work in uh, doing speaker change detection or sp uh, speaker boundary detection. Uh, traditionally, uh, speaker change is a task in uh, speaker diarization is a subtask in speaker diarization So uh, normally, it's used. Uh, we, uh, we use acoustic info, uh, data to do speaker change and speaker diarizations. And in this task, we are using linguistic information, uh, particularly use, uh, with uh, the output from the ASR. So we are using the output from the ASR, which contain uh, text and also some uh, phonetic information as uh, input to our model. So our, the task of our model is to identify the token that will tell us that there is a speaker change. Okay, so uh, to do that, uh, we have a classifier that will identify which token tell us that there is a speaker change or boundary. To train this classifier, we have automatically annotated uh, the label, the data, using the speaker diarization uh corpus. So uh, we from the speaker diarization transcribe transcribed uh, info, uh, data, we, have, we know the time where a speaker start and a speaker end. So this information will help us to label which token uh, happen to indicate the speaker change. So when there is a speaker change, we will label it as one, otherwise we label it as zero. So um, our model is uh, trained uh, using we have a we use a large language model, but and then fine tune it, and on top of it, we have a classifier that will classify the token, whether the, that token indicate a speaker change. So this is the result that we get. We perform two baseline. Um, we have two baseline models. The first baseline model use the reference transcription. And then we use a Montreal force aligner to align and then to train and then test the model. And also, we also have the um, uh, diarization uh, output. And then we, to use it, uh, we use it to calculate the speaker change for this baseline speaker diarization uh results. And for our, uh, for our task, we, uh, use, we, use, we tested two ASR decoder, one using Whisper X with a uh, wave to wag alignment, uh, another wave to wag, uh, sorry, another Whisper with uh, DTW alignment. So, uh, so these are uh, 
meaning this uh, use the output from the ASR decoding for training and then testing. And uh, we have evaluate, evaluated uh, the model uh, using two different metrics. One is token-based metric, another is time-based segment metric uh, from Pionode. The token-based metric basically calculate uh, whether we get the speaker change token correctly. So we calculate the precision and recall. And for the time-based segment metric, we calculate the coverage purity precision and recall. And at the end, we also calculate the average of these four metrics. And if you look at the result, you can see uh, the first one is the baseline result we get using the uh, alignment, uh, using the reference transcription. It performed best at the coverage. Okay, and uh, also at, um, at for the diarization uh, system, we use the Oracle white, uh, voice activation detection plus VBX. The result shows that it performed best at the purity and also recall. And uh, for the whisper uh, plus DTW, uh, the results are more or less average compared to other uh, models. And for the whisper X plus wave to wave, uh, the, we get very good result for precision and recall for the token-based metric and the best result for the precision and overall uh, results. Uh, that uh, If you look at coverage, purity, precision and recall, and the result is um, actually, if you compare with diarization rhization, they are quite similar, slight, only slightly better. So this is a, a surprise for us since uh, it shows that Use, using linguistic information alone can perform on par uh, with the uh, speaker diarization rhization system. So we perform some uh, uh, simple analysis on the Unigram uh, token, top 10 Unigram token of the speaker change. So these are the result obtained from the force alignment uh, with the Montreal force aligner. So this uh, this uh, uh, in uh, descending order. So this U is a special label. We label it uh, for the um, silence or noise at the start of that of an utterance. Okay. So others are other tokens are just uh, lexical tokens. We also perform analysis for the wave, uh, whisper X ASR, the Unigram tokens. So these are token based on some word unit. Uh, we also have the uh, migram from the whisper X uh, analysis. And this is the visualizations um, of the uh, reference. So the, the dot there indicate a speaker change. So, and also this is the result from diarization rhization uh, VBX plus VAD. And this CHG uh, is tell us the speaker change with the, with the whisper X uh, model that uh, which performed the best. And the pink box shows that uh, the uh, place where the uh, speaker change produced is better than diarizations. Okay, so, uh, and we magnify this part here, and this shows that in some cases, uh, in some cases, the output from the linguistic, uh, the linguistic speaker change can perform better than the diarization rhization system. And uh, using linguistic information, uh, as I explained just now, uh, could produce better information in uh, some cases. And this can help, uh, we can use it uh, with uh, maybe a human, with human annotator to make decision, for instance, or probably in the future combine uh, linguistic speaker change with the diarization rhization system. I will pass uh, it to Fatty to continue.
Thank you, uh, Chimping. Hi, um, I'm Fiti and represent the next part. So, contrary to, uh, to what um, Chimping uh, did by using uh, the output of ISR system, we uh, also tried to include actually the speaker change detection in the speech recognition itself, task itself. So what we uh, we did here, we, we said why why not train an ISR system to transcribe and predict at the same time if there is a speaker change, yes or no. So as presented in this picture, the system will be trained in a fashion when there is multiple speakers per segment, and we will would like the system to uh, at the end of the first speaker turn produce uh, a token that will tell us that there is a speaker change and then continue the transcription for the next speaker. So we did this um, uh, using speech brain uh, uh, toolkit and trained on Ali's data set and evaluated on Ali's data set. Here are, you, you have some statistics, the baseline system and uh, evaluated on word error rate on Ali's uh, clean and the word error rate of the system after uh, this training with this speaker um, change uh, fashion. So here you can see a drop in the uh, word error rate um, uh, before and after including uh, two speakers for some segments because we are not able to include two speakers for all the segments. You have here the number of uh, incutted segments compared to the number of segments, but we have uh, running experiments that will uh, narrow a bit uh, the difference between the word error rate before and after. So uh, in order to evaluate this, we did uh, two uh, mainly evaluation in addition to the word error rate. The first one is the purity uh, by detecting uh, if inside one segment we have only one or two speakers, but uh, the detection done by the ASR uh, system itself. And as you can see here is uh, the F1 uh, micro uh, shows that the system is um, uh, good compared to a baseline where we do we say that we have always one speaker uh, which is usually the case when we train our SR systems so we are good at detecting um, uh, segments that contain more than one uh, one speakers we then uh, focus on the segments that have uh, two speakers and we were able to detect at 50 uh, more than 53 percent and 51 percent for dev and test respectively and uh, most of the um, problems we have is the wrong position of detection um, of we detect there is a speaker change but we detect it at the wrong uh, position so we are aims to uh, work more to correct this uh, uh, detection so to conclude this uh, section I try to be <laughs> fast a bit but to, so to conclude this section we started from uh, the idea uh, to study if we are able to detect speaker boundaries using only linguistic informations. We were able to detect this um, uh, by uh, using uh, actually a training system based on the transcription only and integrated this in um, a task done by the uh, speech recognition system uh, itself. We also investigated large lingu language models to be um, trained and fine-tuned um, to um, detect speaker boundaries without any clear conclusion, uh, but we will continue to do th uh, this, and in the future we'll try to include more linguistic information, uh, mainly by using, for example, part of speech tag in addition to the surface form that we do use uh, until now. So that's uh, the conclusion for this part. If you have any questions, <laughs> we'll be happy to answer. <laughs> So I think we will have a break after this uh, part, so questions before the break? So thank you for the last part. Uh, how do you represent uh, the speaker change or speaker identity in the ASR output? Do you have some speaker change? tokens or labeling the words with speakers and can again my usual question can you handle speaker overlap um, so we didn't really uh, include speaker overlap uh, this uh, in this but uh, generally if you see uh, how ASR data are annotated uh, they are segments one speaker per segment um, so what what uh, we did here mainly is to incut the signal and put back the next speakers to be decoded in the same segment and in the linguistic or the, the manual transcription side we put a kind of token speaker change token so to be included in the vocabulary mainly 
if I can add something, I'm not in the team, but uh, I know that for the data we have sometimes, uh, I'm, I think we cannot have the, tr the transcription uh, when you have speakers overlap because sometimes you have more than three speakers speaking at the same time. So it's just a mess. But we'll give it a try. <laughs> So if there is no question, maybe we go for the break. We can. I can discuss later <laughs> if you want. Yeah. No. It's yeah. Okay. Thank you. You can enjoy the pictures uh, while going for coffee. <laughs> this is. Our
Hi. Well, um, should I start? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm Lara. I'm going to talk about continuous emotion detection, uh, a work we have done too. So, another characteristic that we can extract from the audio is the emotion that the person is expressing in this moment. Uh, we can use only speech information to have this data. Um, and this can be useful uh, mostly for the um, output of the idealization part because we can check if the idealization system make a mistake uh, labeling a speaker. We can see if the truly speaker maybe change the emotion at this moment in the conversation. So um, our, with this in mind, our main goal is to develop a system capable of detecting the change in emotional the emotion that a person is having during a conversation. For that, uh, we use two data sets. One is YamoCap that consists of 12 hours of speech from 10 different actors. And the other one is MSP Podcast that has more than 100 hours of speech from more than 1,000 people. Person, people sorry. <laughs> So for both datasets, we have uh, two different labels. Uh, one is categorical, that is consists of the common emotion, anger, frustration, fear, surprise, and so on. And the other one is dimensional label that the annotator, mm, using the self-assessment mannequin, they choose, the, in case of activation, the intensity of the emotion that the person is having. And in case of violence, they choose how positive or negative the emotion is. So first, we start developing a classification and uh, working in the classification tag. That means using the categorical label. Uh, we use only the YEMOCAP data set with the label of anger, happiness, combining with excitement, sadness, and neutral state. Uh, we use cross-validation for testing, uh, taking out one session at each fall. And we also try um, using normalization and not uh, at speak the normalization was done at speaker level. With that, we were able to get the state of the art using the open small feature set uh, that consists on pitch, lounge, cheetah, shim, and the common one. Um, but then if we use um, embedding that were given by the pre-trained model, like what to back or what to learn, and we change the model for a simple CNN, we get a higher, better performance. So um, our, um, our goal was to try to mix different data sets and to be able to do this, we decided to move to a regression tag using the dimensional label because it's much easier to combine because the annotator almost um, have different definition of the categorical label, so it's difficult to join them. So for that, um, we use the two data sets, HemoCAP and Podcast. We use the same model as the classification tag, but we train the DAF function to use the concordant correlation coefficient, that is one that is being used in the, the literature now. And also this one be, was used to present the, the metric for this um, system. Another thing that we apply is that um, the input, well, the model will fit with um, uh, the um, audio, um, with, we shoot only the first, 60 seconds of the audio. If the audio is longer, we cut it. If not, we pass with zero. Something, well, we can see on the mocap, we get the same result that was expected for this data set. In case of postcard, it decreases a lot, but we can see that the um, normalized option is, uh, is good for the system. And something that I would like to highlight is that we combine the mocap and postcard in the training set. For testing, we only use postcard. Uh, so we, the first and second plot is compared to each other between them. Um, we can see that the performance of the system didn't uh, change too much, so that is good for us because we can continue analyzing this um, type of mm, combination. Uh, we should continue working on that. The same, oh, sorry, I completely forgot <laughs> that that was for activation annotation. And the same, we apply the same system for the um, balance annotation, and we get the performance decrease a lot, but the um, conclusion at the same. We can also mix both data set, and we don't have um, 
we don't make the system much work. So um, our annotation will consist of one call at each segment. That means we have a speaker in only one at the segment, and the, annot the annotator choose one call for this segment, like a summary. But we would like to use uh, this system in a, um, in a continuous um, sorry, in a continuous detection. So we would like to have more than one call at the segment. So we change the model to use um, a slidey window with overlap. So because we would like to have much more information at each segment and not only one score. Uh, for that, we um, choose for the training part, we choose randomly a shorter segment of four seconds. In the later two, it has been proved that um, it's enough to, it's not necessary to use the entire audio to get enough information for this task. Um, for the testing, we use a slidey window for second with two second overlap. And here we can see the result for uh, the normalization model, the, the orange at the previous one with a 50 second length, and the other one is the, with four second. And we get uh, the model are same or likely worse, that is not significant. So that means it's not necessary to use the entire audio to get to be able to solve this task. So this is an example of how we would like to use the system. Uh, this is an example using the a model that was trained with YamoCap and Postcat and with the feature set of WebLM. We can see that the score that was predicted by the system are in the same range that the one that was predicted by, by was annotated by someone before. So we would like, we, our main goal was to develop a system capable of detecting the volume and multiple time of the page of a speaker during a conversation. We combine different data sets, um, and we can see that it's not worth the system performance. And also we short the segment of the input, and we can see it's also enough for this task. What we need to continue doing is train more combination of YemoCap and Postcat. I mean, testing only in YemoCap or only in Postcat, but training with both of them to see uh, how to check the robustness in the out of the main tag for our um, purpose. Um, so also we would like to include another data set like CIWA and um, MSP improve, improve and continue shorten the segment to see and we can reduce it. So, question? I think I okay, so I continue. So, another thing that we would like to show is a little demo about all the topics that you can hear until now at this part of the talk. Um, so we choose one audio of the allied dataset randomly, and we see what happened with the output of each of the system that every group had to play today. So um, I would like to show. Yeah. Okay. So the first plot is the reference that means the ground truth. It was labeled manually, so we can see when each speaker is talking, like when he's speaking. Um, the second plot shows the output of the segmentation system that shows us when we have music, noise, overlap, and speech. And the last one is the output of the diarization generalization system that um, shows when we have a different speaker. Um, something I would like to highlight is that the diarization generalization system at this time, I don't know, uh, at this time, after the 100 seconds, uh, make a mistake. He tried to add another speaker. And if you see the segmentation output, we can see that at this moment, it, the audio starts having some music. So we can explain the behavior of the idealization si system using the segmentation. Another um, output that we can check is the speaker chain from text. Um, and we can see also on the same part that it's truly uh, it predicts correctly or it defines pre correctly when a speaker is going when when the speaker is going to change in, in the conversation. We can see it a bit before than the reference part. The 
Another thing that we don't explain this system, but we have it, is like uh, the um, name entity recognition to identify uh, the, um, exactly which picker is picking in this moment. And we can see that Lionel Thompson was correctly identified at the same time that we ha I have showed the previous example that is the same uh, speaker that we have at the reference part. Well, another thing that we can use is the output for the arousal and balance prediction. And I have no conclusion about this part because it's necessary to have more, uh, more conversation and maybe more useful when you have two speakers than so many times. So, no, coffee break, no, we all drink. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Mm. Okay, um, so hello, I'm Antonio, uh, and I'm going to start explaining uh, some of the methods that we, we have followed to explain models and uh, their, de their decisions. So first, I'm gonna start presenting what I've been doing with Alfonso. Uh, our goal was to have a model that worked well in different tasks. So we divided uh, both in regression and classification tasks, and also, additionally, we also wanted to have some explanation from that model or the outputs of that model, at least. So the method that we followed for that was to have a latent space representation, but with a set of constraints that we impose by design, uh, which hopefully this will allow some degree of understanding or explanation. So first, for the regression task, we propose to use a variation autoencoder, but with constraints in the latent space. So we define two independent latent distribution, one of them which corresponds to information that we, that we know, which means that it's label, or at least pseudo-label, and the other one corresponds to information that we don't know, which means that uh, it's unlabeled. Since we assume that these two latent variables are independent, we have that the large function is the reconstruction term, and the sum of these two k divergences, one of them corresponding uh, to the output of the encoder corresponding to the label latent space, and the target uh, latent distribution, and the other one the same for the unlabeled latent distribution. So I'm going to show you one application of this method. So this, uh, we're, we're going to try to use it for, uh, to do domain translation. So first, to initialize, we first define a base target mean, which we define randomly. After that, we define uh, as many rotation matrices as classes we have. And after that, we obtain uh, target distributions uh, per class, different target distributions per class, by multiplying uh, the previous rotation matrices by, by the base target mean. And then we get these, uh, these means. And then after that, we assume, that we impose uh, that the distribution, that the target distribution is a normal distribution with the mean that I explained for an identity matrix as covariance matrix. So after that, once we have trained the system by trying to minimize the last function that we can see in the slide, we have that given an input x, it's class C and a target class T. Uh, we first get the two latent variables, the label and the unlabeled one. After that, we rotate the latent, latent space to the target class by multiplying uh, to the inverse uh, of the rotation matrix corresponding to the input class. After that, uh, we get this like base latent variable. And after that, we multiply that base latent variable by the rotation matrix corresponding to the target uh, class. And after that, we pass the, the label uh, latent variable and the unlabeled latent variable that we didn't change at all through the uh, encoder, uh, so through the decoder, sorry. And we get uh, some of the results. We, we did some experiments that I'm going to show you now. Uh, the first of them was with the very well-known data set MNIS. Here we have, uh, we have some numbers, and we want to uh, translate, uh, to, to change the digit, but keep uh, all the information which is not the digit. So in this case, it would be the thickness, the inclination, uh, summary, everything which is not the, the digit. And as you can see here, we are able to more or less keep the same style, but uh, having new digits. So on the left, we have the original image, and uh, all the right uh, images correspond to uh, an image created by our variational autoencoder by modifying this latent space. So here, other example with the Street View House Numbers data set. Here, uh, our goal is to keep uh, everything which is not a digit again. For example, in this case, it would be a color, uh, some extra digits, the inclination of the digits as well. 
Uh, here we can see also a very interesting thing, which is that in some images we have more than one digit, but the model knows that it only has to uh, change uh, or to modify the one which is in the middle, because well, while we were training the model, the labels correspond to the digit which is, which is in the middle in those images that have uh, more than one digit. So here, this final example is we try to rotate cars. We here, um, the idea is to just change the angle of the cars, but keep the same color, the same car model, this, uh, also the shadow, if we have shadow. So um, here, the input is a car in, an, in a given angle, and we want to modify that angle, but keeping uh, every, uh, I mean, keeping the same car. So on the same color and everything. Here you can see that it works uh, quite well. So. Uh, sadly, the goal of this workshop is not to rotate cars, so we have to switch from vision to audio data. So here we find two more challenge challenges. One of them is that we have to uh, model sequences, and also we can have uh, inputs uh, with different lengths. So the first, uh, I mean, the, the application that we did was instrument translation. We did uh, with this mainly Solos DB dataset. The problem with this dataset is that we have uh, less than 20 minutes for uh, every instrument which are not piano and violin. So we only took piano and violin. We have around two hours of each instrument, a bit less. And we took the spectrum, we passed it through the TCN encoder, we modified uh, some of the, some the, the label latent variable to make the translation. We pass uh, these latent variables through the TCN decoder to get uh, a new spectrum. So here, as you can see, I show you some of the reconstructions of the translation. Uh, as you can see, the reconstruction is not perfect, um, but uh, it's like a kind of filter version of the input, but uh, we are gonna try to listen them to see if, uh, some of them, just to see if, uh, how they listen. This is the original. Now I'll show you the piano and the violin translation. You can see it's a kind of filter version of the input. This is like, uh, this, should, oh, sorry. this should be a violin. Let's listen some more examples. Now we will listen some examples in the other, in the other way from violin to piano. As you can see, it sounds, uh, the problem when we are going from uh, violin to piano is that uh, in this data set, the notes in the violin are very long and we are not so used to listen so very long notes in piano, so it, sounds, uh, it doesn't sound very natural, but I think that it sounds more or less, at least the first part of the notes, more like a piano. Um, so the goal again is not to translate instruments. Uh, the actual goal is to have an explainable digestion system and for that we want to have an explainable speaker characterization and for that we are going to try to build an explainable classifier. So to do this, uh, we are just, instead of having a variational encoder as we had for regression, we are just uh, have a variational classifier which is just, uh, we have the same encoder and in the variational uh, autoencoder but we just substitute the decoder by a linear layer softmax because the task actually is a classification. And also we are gonna impose some constraints in the latent space. We'll have also two independent latent distributions, one of them corresponding to the label, uh, to the known information, and the other one corresponding to the unknown information. And here the last function is the same, but instead of having this m a mean score error as, as uh, in the first term, we have the cross entropy because the actual goal of this task is uh, to the classification. So here we have an application that we did with this system. Um, so this application was to have an explainable classification according to a set of attributes that we define as first uh, input. After that, once we have defined what uh, attributes we, we want to explain, we define a distribution of the latent space that depends on these attributes. 
So again, once we have trained our system, uh, we want to explain the output. So uh, the first step is that we can understand the latent variable because since in during the training we wanted to minimize the KL divergence between the output of the uh, label latent variable in the coder and the and this vision that depends on the attributes. So uh, if we sample from the from the output of the encoder, uh, we should that embedding or that uh, variable should contain some information on the attributes. And Furthermore, we could also try to understand the model, or at least the last layer of the model, since uh, the predictions uh, are typically obtained applying a linear layer and softmax to the, to the latent space, to the embeddings in this case. So the relation between the label latent, latent variable and the predictions can be analyzed to get some information on how these uh, attributes and predictions are related. So we did like a very simple experiment with the MOCAP, trying to explain trying to explain how different um, different attributes that we define are related to the to the emotions. So here we chose F0 medium, F0 S standard deviation, and loudness. So after that, we got, uh, after getting those attributes, we got the 33 and 67 percentages for each of them. So while training, we discretized the attributes in low, medium, high, according to the percentage we, we calculated before. And after that, we define the target distribution for each attribute by using uh, 100 encoding. Uh, for the mean, as I show here, uh, we have 100 for low, 010 for medium, and 001 for high. And then we assume that uh, the distribution was uh, a normal distribution with that mean and identity matrix as covariance matrix. So here we show, uh, I show uh, some, of the, some of the results. In the first row, we can see the joint probability of each emotion and each of the levels of each attribute that we uh, wanted to explain. And in the second row, we have the weights of the last layer, which connects uh, the component corresponding to each of the level of each attributes to, to the emotions. And here we can see some interesting results. For example, uh, in the case when we have uh, high loudness and angry, we have that the joint probability of these two, uh, of this attribute level and emotion is very high. And also we have that the weight that relates this high loudness to the angry uh, is high, is positive and high. And oh, the one that relates uh, the low, um, yeah, the low loudness and angry is negative and very, ne uh, the most negative actually. Something similar we can see for the, for the, for example, for the case of high uh, standard deviation pitch and happiness, and yeah, so we can extract some information directly by analyzing the weights of the last layer. For example, we can also see that the less relevant um, attributes is the F0 medium, and this is something that we can just see by checking uh, the weights of the last layer without doing any analysis of the uh, trained data set. So finally, uh, I show you the last application, which was to have this speaker characterization uh, depending on the environment, which in some sense is explainable. Here we have uh, two extra challenges as well. We can also have variable length input, and we can also have different classes in train and test. So for that, we first initialize um, we, we define first uh, a set of attributes describing the environment, uh, which could be the output of, for example, a multitask segmentation system or the type of augmentation using, used during training, tra training phase. After we, uh, we define this set of attributes, we define a distribution of the latent space that depends on these attributes and each speaker is. So once we have trained the system, we, have, we, we want to know if mm, given two inputs, we want to know if they correspond to the same speaker of uh, they don't. So we calculate the mean of the label latent variable for each audio. Uh, and after that, we calculate the cosine similarity as, as a score. Um, and this could be the typical score, but we also want to explore in the future uh, some other metrics taking the adv uh, advantage of having distribution in the latent space instead of having just yes, one embedding, such as, for example, we could use this uh, symmetric scale divergence between the two distribution. We could also use other, um, other metrics such as cross entropy or rear score, something like that, to compare the two distributions. Finally, I'm gonna show you the, um, some of the results, some of the experiments we, we performed, and some of the results. For that, we just took uh, ICAP a TDNN system, and we just modified, we switched that uh, arc phase layer loss by this cross entropy and KL variance, um, and we trained the system with Voxeleb. So here we have uh, maybe the four uh, most important experiments we perform. The first one was the non-explainable baseline, which was using this uh, R-phase softmax. The second one 
was by using by, by defining um, the mean of the target distribution depending only on the speaker and make that mean trainable, as you can see. And we uh, we didn't uh, use that uh, extra unlabeled information for the I mean that extra dimensions for the. Uh, unlabeled latent distribution. So as you can see here, the results were uh, worse and in the baseline it was, uh, yeah, it was a bit worse. So in the next uh, experiment, what we tried to do is to, instead of making the means uh, trainable, we made them to be as separate as possible. We made them to be quasi-orthogonal. That the point is that uh, the means of different speakers should be as far as possible in the latent space. We didn't use um, uh, the uh, dimensions for the unlabeled latent distribution neither. And we got here better results than in the previous experiment. This one are closer to the uh, non-explainable baseline. Finally, in the in the next experiment, what we did is to define the label latent space in the same way as in the previous experiment, but we added those extra dimensions for the unlabeled latent space. Uh, here we got a bit worse results than in the previous case. And one of the things that we didn't like a lot is that we got that 5% for the uh, unsupervised, uh, for the unknown label, label, label latent distribution, and we would like to uh, get a very high equal error rate because, because ideally we would like not to have uh, information of the speaker at all in, in that uh, latent distribution. So finally, the next thing that we would like to try is to make the distribution, the target distribution of the label uh, latent space to depend also on the environment and the idea that we have for that is to just have this um, this means that depends on the speaker and rotate something in the space depending on the environment. If we have a speaker here, we want to rotate in some angles. The, for example, we have music background or, uh, or in the background or uh, in rotating other dimension. If you have uh, background noise and rotate it more or less depending on the noise level. Uh, but we don't have results yet, so we hopefully will have something in, in the future. So finally, as final conclusions, we first uh, divide the latent space into known and unknown information. Um, we can make the non latent space uh, depend on some attributes. Um, we have also demonstrated that can be useful for domain translation, for explainable classification, and a speaker characterization as well. And a feature experiment, we want to have a speaker characterization uh, depending on the, on the environment, which in some sense we could say could be uh, explainable. So thank you. Hello, so it's me again. And I'm going to present our work that we did uh, by, uh, with the experiments with incorporating the uncertainty information into the embeddings, as the embeddings are used by our most of the derivation models. So this, we think, could be beneficial. And the work is based on a very simple idea that one shouldn't trust the embedding extracted from short and noisy recording as much as the one which was long and clean. So in the latter case, probably there is more speaker information that you could build your embedding upon. And uh, to pursue this idea, we were very much inspired by the XI vector approach that is uh, described in this paper or introduced in this paper. And here, what it does, basically, uh, they are just, instead of estimating the embedding as a single point, uh, the embedding extractor is supposed to output a posterior distribution of the embedding, and uh, in this case it is modeled by Gaussian distribution, uh, where the original embedding would serve as a mean of this distribution, and the precision, which is precision matrix, which is the just inverse of the covariance matrix, uh, re actually reflects the uncertainty about where the true embedding is if you have infinite, infinite long uh, clean recording. And uh, in this model, the precisions are estimated on frame by frame levels, so we can track this uncertainty in time domain as well. And here is just a very quick recap of what this model does. So if you look at the picture, basically if we ignore the things which are in this uh, dashed line block, this is a standard embedding extractor, you have some encoder pulling few layers after the encoder and you extract the embedding. What make it makes it the embedding with uncertainty is this additional branch here, which is supposed to extract the precision matrices for the 
each output of the uh, of the encoder. And uh, okay, maybe I'm not going to go into much details about the generative model, but uh, what is important here to notice is that by defining some generative model, we directly get the formulation of how the pooling should be done if we believe that this is the correct model. And also we know how to uh, summarize the precision, so basically the certainty about our embedding across the whole utterance. And uh, the model is nice, but uh, so far it's not very logical why it should produce you some reasonable precisions because it's kind of the, it's trained with normal typical speaker loss, which does not encourage the output of this extra branch to be good precisions. So we wanted to examine a little bit uh, what actually it produces. And um, here's one example. So here, uh, what I was doing is I take test set of Voxelab 1 and extract the precisions uh, for it. And uh, here you see the histogram in blue uh, of these precisions for Voxelab 1 when I used the original version. And then I also augmented it with some addi additive noise and extracted the embeddings again or not the embedding, the precisions. And uh, the orange histogram corresponds to the precisions of the augmented version of Voxelab 1. And here we can be a little bit happy that the orange histogram is shifted to the left compared to the uh, blue one, meaning that on average the precisions are lower when we have more noisy utterances than the original ones. Uh, another thing that we can take a look at is this temporal precisions, as I said. So here, uh, the uh, black line on the plot corresponds to this precision extracted every 80 milliseconds in our utterance, uh, uh, utterance. And the colorful lines are the output of the segmentation model from our team. So basically here, uh, what, what we would like to see is that when we observe that any of the colorful lines are high, so meaning that, for example, there is high probability of noise or overlap, for example, then the precision should go down. And uh, probably we see the strongest in case of no, like when uh, the segmentation model doesn't find any speech, then we really can observe that the precision is lower, which is probably what we expected. So now we kind of verify the, that the precisions are more or less reasonable and these are some results that uh, were uh, obtained with this model. So here uh, we see three different models. One is the traditional embedding extractor, which doesn't use any uncertainty information. Then the second one is basically the baseline XI vector. And the last one is a little bit smarter at XI vector in the sense that it uses the precision extraction branch uses additional input, which at training time is basically SNR of the additive noise that was used to augment the training data. And at test time, this would be the output also, like the posteriors, as I showed before, from the segmentation team. And uh, we see that uh, for speaker verification task, uh, the models that use precision manage to improve a little bit the results over the model that doesn't. However, the improvement is kind of marginal, you would say. And uh, for the diarization, we compare the same three models. And here, the last, like the start numbers are the last minute numbers, so they are not completely trustable, so I wouldn't, I would take them with the grain of salt. But otherwise, we would see that for die hard at least, uh, the precision, including this mm, precision or uncertainty information helps to improve even the diarization rezation result. And just to have some intermediate conclusion. So why do we care about instructing this uncertainty? It's because it provides the user with a way to estimate how confident the model is when it provides a decision. And uh, it's beneficial, for example, when doing error analysis and also can improve the derivation perf performance itself. And uh, in future, we think that it's a good idea to uh, modify the model so that uh, the uncertainty estimation that we get from the model are more sensible. For example, by introducing some 
specific laws which would encourage the behavior that we like for, for these matrices. And also we can incorporate this uncertainty estimates into the clustering algorithm itself. So this is it for me and I pass it to Marie. Thank you. So now I will, I'm going to present another way to constrain the latent space uh, using uh, mainly sparsity and non-negativity. So for example, the idea uh, is that if you want to give a characteristic of Le Mans, you are not going to, to describe the presence of bridges, river, and medieval city, but you prefer to say that there is the 24-hour circuit. You may not say that there is no Eiffel Tower, this is not very informative. Regarding speech, you can say, for example, uh, that there is presence of so some formants, some silence, or some acoustic information, but this is not really uh, characteristic. Maybe if a speaker has a strong regional accent, it would be more uh, discriminant. And we will, you will probably not say that there is no uh, low F0. So this motivate, uh, motivates the, um, the use of sparsity and non-negativity to constrain the latent space. So to do so, we have we have uh, trained an autoencoder that doesn't compress the information, but in the contrary, we spread the information uh, in the in the middle. So we train it on top of x vectors. We have three losses. Uh, one is the reconstruction loss, and the two other enforce the sparsity of the um, embeddings, and we enforce also the fact that they are non-negative. So we have a capped ReLU uh, loss function. So we can see here how many zero and ones we have in our spine vectors. So the baseline is 137 for year on voxel one And we check that we do, do not degrade too much the results with our spine vectors. So these are real values. We can see the number of zero in blue and the number of one uh, in red. So the number of gray values are in between zero and one. And they are becoming one when we are going to binaries this, um, these spine vectors. And we have here three different values of sparsity. So 15, we have very low value of zero. And 70%, we have a, a large number of zero. So we can see that we degrade the ER. But so far, the, 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 the 3.15 ER contains a lot of zero. So we have made a decision with, uh, with, uh, many, uh, uh, with very few ones. So we have checked if this, uh, this uh, constraint in the latent space do not degrade the performances on several tasks. So we have tried on ER. We can see um, that, so I already showed the result, but we can see in red that the binarization doesn't degrade so much the results also in comparison to the real values. Uh, we have compared also the diarization, uh, uh, performances on these three spine uh, vectors. And even if the spine 70 percent degrades uh, a little bit the ER values, we continue to have, uh, we maintain the performances in terms of DR. So it means that the information maybe we, we have removed for a speaker verification uh, is not useful for um, diarization, so maybe environment information. Um, and we also checked that we have, we have no degradation on two classifiers, so gender and emotion. Uh, regarding gender, we can see that uh, we have good performances either with spine or with binary uh, spine uh, vectors. And regarding emotion, so we have a small data set, so it's not very easy to have generalizable the results, but so far, the binarization seems to degrade uh, uh, quite a lot on the 15% uh, spine approach because, in fact, we, you have a lot of values in between 0 and 1. So maybe these values are informative uh, for emotion classification. But with the very sparse and binary uh, vector, we have quite reasonable results. So this means that we can continue to work on this spine, uh, spine version, so to constrain uh, the latent space to be binary and uh, sparse. And we then have tried to make this link between the representation space, so our sp uh, spine uh, vectors, and uh, the informative world. Oh, it's okay. Hello, I am Imen. <coughs> so as a continuity to what Mary uh, presented, here the goal is to uh, investigate the representation world, which is the uh, spine uh, vectors. 
and um, get the most rele uh, relevant dimensions with respect to uh, two specific tasks, which is uh, emotion and um, gender classification. So uh, as a first step, we um, did uh, dimension uh, selection using three uh, methods. Uh, the first one is, is with a simple classifier, and then we have the um, ranking uh, on uh, the most important features f uh, based on this classifier. Uh, another one is uh, by using the Chaplet values to, um, to uh, obtain the uh, most uh, contributed uh, features for uh, the predictions of the model. And the third method, which is the LDA-based uh, uh, approach, which selects the most discriminant uh, features. So for the task of gender classification, here we use the spine 15% uh, 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 sparsity. Um, here we trained uh, a random forest classifier on Voxaleb1, uh, which gives uh, an accuracy of 99%. And um, we selected the uh, six most important uh, features using the three uh, selection methods. So uh, just um, to say that Using only those most important features, we get an accuracy of 75% uh, uh, for this uh, task. And to explain this nice plot, uh, here we have the uh, most important uh, features. And the line uh, linking each feature to uh, each method, it represents the uh, importance of this feature uh, selected by each of the methods. We can uh, conclude from this that um, uh, the three methods uh, selected the most uh, uh, selected uh, have the same uh, uh, the three methods are commonly selecting the most important uh, features but then uh, at the end we see that there are uh, some uh, difference of uh, the selection with respect to uh, the three methods uh, here is uh, the same thing but with uh, the spine 70% uh, sparsity so uh, next, um, I, uh, the next goal is to, uh, uh, to have a mapping between the representation uh, world and informative world. So uh, the representation world here represent our uh, binary spine uh, vectors and the informative world, which choose it to be the uh, open smile uh, descriptors, which is the set uh, of uh, EGMAP's uh, 88 uh, functionals of F0 formats, spectral, etc. And we, um, we choose uh, four different uh, selection uh, methods to select the uh, descriptors uh, that describe best uh, the most important features related to gender and emotion uh, detection tasks. Um, so uh, one method is to calculate the correlation between the features and the descriptors. Uh, another uh, method is to um, is based on the uh, importance of each uh, descriptor uh, using the uh, Guinea importance or uh, Chaplet values. Another one is based on the discriminant power of each uh, descriptor, and the last selection uh, method is uh, an entropy-based uh, approach which combine uh, many descriptors and give us the most important ones based on the interaction between all of those. So uh, just to give you an overview about all the um, method, um, because we, we didn't choose one only one uh, method to do uh, this selection, because uh, for each one we have some advantages and disadvantages, for example, for uh, Guinea importance and Chaplet values, they consider uh, each uh, descriptor independent of all the others. Uh, but since we have some correlation between all the descriptors, maybe it's not so, so relevant to, to, to consider uh, this uh, method. Uh, but for example, for uh, SLDA, it selects the most informative infor uh, descriptor for the um, the task in question, and for uh, the last uh, approach, it takes, as I said, uh, the combination of uh, variables because it returns more information than considering only one uh, descriptor independently of the others. So uh, this is just to show you the um, when we calculate the person correlation between the descriptors that we have and the uh, representation word, which are the features, we can find that there are some groups of uh, descriptors that are related 
to uh, some features. And uh, here, uh, if we use the uh, uh, Shapley uh, contributions, we can, if we take one, one example, we can uh, provide uh, some local uh, explanation for just uh, the, uh, this uh, waveform. Uh, so for the representation word, if we take the dimension number uh, 318, which is equal to zero for this uh, waveform, uh, we have this explanation of um, of this feature specifically so uh, we have a probability of prediction for class 0 which is a 91 uh, percent uh, yes 91 percent and we have we can see also the descriptors that contributed to obtaining uh, this value uh, to have a global uh, explanation for um, all the the examples that we can have for gender classification. So here it's just for the system uh, spine uh, 15. Um, this is the same plot uh, that I presented here. We can find for the most important uh, features that we selected for the gender classification, we can find that there is um, some uh, descriptors that can describe those features, which are uh, mostly related to F0, which we know that it, it is a very important uh, descriptor for gender uh, classification. Uh, another example here, but is for emotion uh, detection. So for emotion detection, we take also the most important features and we describe them. We find that uh, there are uh, some fam family of uh, descriptors which are related to MFCC, loudness, uh, voice quality, spectral rhythm, and formats. So here, uh, just an example of an explainable speaker uh, diarization diarization, use case. So here, it's a real example from LA's, uh, LA's data. Uh, we have the segmentations, and we have the gender of each uh, speaker. So uh, from the representation world, we can extract the spine vectors. We can have, if we take uh, the most important uh, dimension that we selected uh, as important for uh, gender, we can provide the explanations for this um, dimension for each segment. Uh, uh, using uh, Shapley uh, toolkit, and for each um, for each uh, segment, we can provide the descriptors that contributed to uh, that feature. So, uh, to conclude, for all uh, the sport, the question for the sport was how to get an explainable representation space by uh, applying some constraints on it, and how to interpret this space. So we did this by um, uh, constraining uh, the uh, representation space as Antonio uh, presented with uh, his uh, methods, uh, based on the uh, attribute, uh, doing a speaker uh, characterization. And um, we found that it reinforces explainability, and uh, also using the spine vectors, we found that binarization is definitely uh, useful to provide more uh, explanations. Um, and we also we uh, obtained some uh, linkage between the representation uh, world that is uh, abstract and the informative uh, world, which represents a very nice step towards uh, interpretability. Um, and also uh, from what uh, Anna presented, uh, we, uh, uh, we, f we, we found that including confidence on the uh, embeddings, which are the XI uh, vectors, open a new perspective. And for future, we are uh, exp maybe we can explore a larger informative world, including phonetic and linguistic uh, information. So let me uh, leave the space for the third part. Okay, hello. I hope you're still there. We are reaching the end, so we, we almost got it. So on my side, I will let the speaker embeddings aside and talk about multi-label segmentation. And we have seen before that a part of our team has developed a multi-label segmentation model, which is uh, working okay. And But the problem is that this model is a black box, so we would like to develop a more explainable model based on this black box model. And the idea here is to use a uh, thing presented before in that paper, which uses a non-negative matrix factorization, NMF, to, uh, 
to include it into a proxy model that will reproduce what the black box model does. Uh, so to resolve question, first, can we apply this uh, method to the multi-level segmentation and reach similar performance as the original model? And second question is, what explanation can we retrieve from that model? So here is our architecture. Uh, I will go a bit fast on it because we are short on time. But the idea is that here we have the uh, original multi-level segmentation model. So from the audio, we go to the uh, logit, so the segmentation here. Uh, then we have our proxy model, which is trained in a teacher-student manner, composed of two functions, the psi function, which maps the wave LM features to the H embedding here. And then we have just a linear layer theta, which maps the H embedding to the decision space. Um, so why are we having H here? So this is to fit the NMF framework. H is a time activation embedding, so it represents the time. And W is a pre dictionary of frequencies, so it represents the frequency domain. And by multiplying W by, by, w by H, sorry, we can reconstruct a spectrogram. So we are in the spectrogram domain. How do we train everything? Uh, first, we have a knowledge distillation loss here. So to make the teacher model fit the uh, or original model distribution. Then we have an NMF uh, loss here. So to do so, we extract the spectrogram from the input and try to minimize the distance between the target spectrogram and the reconstructed one. And finally, we enforce sparsity over H to make it uh, easier to interpret. So first, the results. Uh, we tested this model uh, around Aragon Radio, Die Hard 3, and Ally Skin Test, and showed that the performance of the teacher and the proxy slash student model are the same, or a bit better sometimes. And performance is nice, but then we have to explain, because it's our goal here. So to explain, I will only focus on the last part of the model, from H to uh, the decision. So H is the embedding obtained for a given X audio segment uh, containing one class. The first step is to apply a temporal pooling to H, so we get a Z vector in the of K dimensions here. So this vector is then multiplied by the weights of the linear layer according to a given class. So by doing so, we obtain a R value here, which is a relevance score. Uh, so we know that what component is relevant to classify one class. So nice, we, we are able to identify which components are relevant for the classification. But then we have to use this. So keep in mind that by multiplying W by uh, uh, H, we are able to go back to the frequency domain. Then from the relevance vector, we are able to select some components given a threshold and get a new vector. And since they lay in the same space, we are able to project this relevance into the frequency domain. So having, we will get something like this, so a uh, W matrix, some activated components, and we get something in the frequency domain. This is nice, but we have also to measure how removing components are uh, impacting the decision of the model. So, sorry, from the selected components, we will just keep them in H and get the decision from the masked H version. We can do this kind of plot then. So on top, you have the frequency versus the threshold. And you have the relevant component for the classification. And we are increasing the threshold, so we are re reducing the number of activated components. And under, you have what I have called confidence, but it isn't a real confidence. It is the model output. And so we see that by removing some components, we are decreasing the confidence of the model, which makes sense. And also, we can identify which components are re really relevant to classification and what we should not remove. Then we can compare between speech, music, and overlap speech, and see that the frequency bands used by the model are not the same. But this is local, so we can do this at the like segment level. N what we want then is a more global explanation, so we will do this a relevance vector extraction for a set of segments, for a set of classes, and get uh, an average uh, relevance vector over this set of segments. And we can plot this kind of thing. So we have, on a global point of view, the average relevance of each NMF component, and see that some are common between overlap and speech, for instance. Some are really discriminative between speech in blue and uh, overlapping speech in orange. Also that some are really specific to music and some specific to speech. 
So by doing so, we know that from these components that we can project to this frequency space, we can identify what information in the data is used and or necessary to classify each class. So to conclude on this task, on this part, we propose the proxy model, which is a training a future student approach, uh, which uh, tends to do uh, multi-level segmentation. Uh, so we applied the NMF framework to make an embedding to spectrogram mapping and explain the decision in the of the model in the embedding in the frequency space. Uh, the results show that the performance are similar between the teacher and the student, and also that we are able to explain things. So yeah, we have things to improve that are listed here, and we can discuss later. So I'll give the floor to Thomas. Thank you. So hi, um, I'm Thomas, I'm, and I'm wanting to look at uh, what happened on uh, generalization systems, especially the uh, clustering-based one. So they're using X vectors, so I need to look on the spectrogram, what makes two X vectors similar. For that, I used the uh, visualization technique, so we're going to see some images here. Uh, that is, I mean, ba uh, that was in initially made for images, but here we're going to try to look at where are the gradients on the spectrogram when we generate uh, X vector. So we're taking two spectrograms from the same speaker, two different spectrograms, and we're going to look at what makes them similar according to, uh, according to our loss. But because they're gradients, we want to integrate them to have something more visual. So as we fade our target spectrogram, we're going to integrate of course, our little fading parameter alpha to get gradients. So this big image are the gradients for one spectrogram. Where are the areas of interest in terms of temporal and spectral uh, place? So let's take a look, what can we see? We can see that whenever there is no speech, like breathing parts, there is no gradient, it's not useful for, authenti for authentication. And we don't have a uniform distribution of the gradients. Some areas, some frequencies are more used. So we're gonna try to look with the information we have, one of them being uh, the alignment with the phonemes. Where are some phonemes and is the linguistic information linked to where we have more or less gradients? So we segmented that and we looked at uh, which phonemes have more information. And it seems that in blue here, voyols contain slightly more information, of course being normalized by the energy and the time that they were used. But still, voyols seems to contain a bit more information than various concerns. So we try to divide them by different uh, font categories using the manner or the place. It's not really significant, the variation. We still have each time our blue bar voyols that are still more used. So we try to look per speaker. Uh, this, is m this is measured on a Vox Celebrant set, that's why we only have uh, 40 speakers here. And there is still some variation for each speaker on which Vox is going to use more this or this category of phoneme. Um, overall, I'm going really fast here because we don't have a lot of time. <laughs> uh, we have a technique, Interacted Gradients, that is also really fast to use a compute. And it, uh, precisely enough, can show you in different parts of the spectrum what is used. Um, it's not going to be uniform across the phones, but uh, we can at least see that voyals are going to be slightly more used. Uh, we have two, sp two perspectives on that. One of them is specifically the impact of some phones, not on the gradients, but on the performances. And that's what Gabriel can present uh, just after. And the other one is how can we mix it with other explainability techniques, like how those gradients would behave in a constrained space. And that will be for another time. So I'm going to give the mic to Gabriel. Hi, everybody. Uh, beginning the war in Le Mans with this question. Uh, in, in reality, I don't sure if we have resolved in the beginning of the war, but oh, sorry. Uh, uh, first, we control one system based in two principal states. The first state, the idea of the first state is find the, the phoneme time aligned for each signal in the speaker recognition. And the second uh, state have several categories of phoneme based on Montreal force alignment. First, you want to select one cate category for one vector. You can use or you can mix to it several categories. You can use the vowel. You can use the nasal, uh, the consonant, and you you can use all the the content the voice content and for this we we have the, the first result using 
the consonant and vowel. The consonant is all phoneme different of the vowel. You ha we have 40 equal array and six equal array, but you you f you see the the time used for each category. You you know you that the vowel use less information, less uh, time in the signal. Then we prepare one method for select the f for fix the time in for two signal using the random method, of course. And you can see similar equal array when you f using only the 37 percent is the time if for each signal. Um, what happens is if use the consonant and vowel for a speaker recognition using only the 37 second. We have C 3.9 for equal rate. Um, if you compare with the baseline, the baseline is X vector based on a speech brain, we have five of equal rate. Is good using all the phoneme in the signal, is you is good use all the voice content or or not. Then the next experiment we prepare one baseline using all the signal. We have zero point eight of equal rate, um, you use the consonant and the vowel. All, uh, the, when you use the consonant and the vowel, you use all the voice content in the signal, we have 0 0.9. It's very close, it's good for us, but when you see the, the, the average time used for all phoneme, you can see 83% eight, eight, three, three of the time. Then when you fix the, the same time for the baseline, we have very close result. It's good result for us because show us we have used all the voice content in the signal. We use the good information from the speaker verification. And then we see what is the, 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 the next experiment. What happened is I use the same, the common font between each part of the signal for a speaker verification. Well, we have 2.3 equal rate using the common font, but when you see the, 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 the time, you, f you find you use only 45% 40, 40, of the time between each signal in the speaker recognition. Um, what happens is use the same time for all the phone in the signal or for the baseline, then you using the common phone, we have the better result. Is very instant result. I think we, we can continue work on this, but for me this good good result. But the principal result in the fair the principal result in the war is not for speaker recognition. The principal result is for control the word space, control what are you using for obtain the, uh, the embedding of the speaker because you can try, you can now use several signal of the same speaker for control two embeddings, three embeddings, four embeddings. Then you you have what is the difference between these two embeddings? The speaker is the same, the content is the same. Maybe you can find the similarity between them. Similarity refer the dimension of the embedding. Or you can change for different speaker. You use it's, you you can use uh, several uh, signal for each different speaker, and you can find the different between the dimension of each uh, speaker. Or you can find the gender di different or speaker is the the final result. Uh, hello, I'm Norbert, and uh, the problem here is how to organize the, the some space to m compress the descriptor, the descriptor coming from the real world, which could be x vector in the high dimension and irregular one, to the con uh, conditional latent space where we, this will be regular and 
in low dimension. And from then, you can, uh, from this latent space, you can see how to obtain the uh, pseudo label and compare this pseudo label from the label coming from the input or from the acoustic description. To do this, uh, I will skip. To, to do this, we introduced some constraints during uh, the training of the variational autoencoder. These constraints were just a label of the data, and the, this forced the latent space to be organized into, into many clusters, where each cluster is, is just one class. And then we can go from this cluster to obtain the pseudo label, which are also the label in the data, and we compare them. This was just inspired by this article, and we and we train, but we are not trained like them. But we train using uh, the the centroid reconstruction as our uh, prototype. To the evaluation, we calculate the score, the label matching score between the pseudo label and the label coming from the real world. And we also evaluate the link between this the, uh, latent space dimension and the dimension coming from informative world. This is was, use, uh, was done using uh, linear regression. And then for the first evaluation, we trained the, the model using two dimensions in the latent space and for the classification problem, which was two class, we also used two prototypes. And the matching score was uh, more than 99%. And from then, we used the decision tree, which is for us a white box to see which, which part of the descriptor were re responsible for the classification. After this, we we train also uh, linear regression and to see also which part of the, this descriptor was responsible of uh, the, the li very li were linked to the, uh, each latent space dimension. And from then, we saw that uh, the, 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 the same features, but the, the feature obtained from the anti-set of feature was just a derivative of some features on in the pro, uh, provided by the decision tree. We make it for all the dimension, and, and then we can conclude by this word, the latent space, the concept we introduce in the latent space permits to well organize this latent space, and then the latent space, as it in the few dimension, we can visualize and analyze easily. And for the next, we will uh, try to more calibrate the parameter of the model, and we also test it on the, some other classification problem. For the takeaways of uh, this group, in this group, the the main question was. Which part of an audio signal are the most important for some uh, speech processing tasks? For the audio segmentation, the group proposed the non-negative non matrix factorization to see how to see which part of frequent band is responsible of different segment of uh, after segmentation. For the for the speaker verification. Uh, we, the group proposed to go back to the spectrogram and see which pixel in the spectrogram is responsible, characterize each speaker, or which phoneme can be changed to go from one speaker to another. And from the last one, we combine acoustic features and X vector for the gender classification. I will give the floor to Marie to, for the final word. Thank you. I am really pressed to conclude because I have uh, at least minus 15 minutes to do it, so I'm going to be very fast. Uh, so for the evaluation, I will skip this part, but we have two ideas. We can discuss it after. 
Um, so our goal was to provide a multitask, multimodal spe speaker generalization input and provide some list of attributes. So we have done this work. We have a framework to use partially annotated data and calibration. We have demonstrated that the linguistic information can be useful for the diarization in complementation to the acoustic diarization um, Also, um, we, have a s we had a second goal that was to explain the decision of the model. So it's still pending because it's a very good, very huge work that requires a large amount of people to do it. So we have uh, shown that the binarization is definitely uh, useful and that we can constrain the latent space in order to have better explainable model. And we have also enforced the linkage between this representation and this uh, informative world in order to have this formula um, more theoretical formulation of the problem. Um, so maybe we are here. Uh, we were at the starting point. We were looking for good performance and then we come at the workshop result. We have explainable representation. And so far, we have reached uh, this point uh, towards informative world. Um, maybe in, other, in another step, I don't know, maybe 2030, we will be on the top of the mountain. <laughs> so uh, I just would like to thank uh, the, the, the experimental project, also Jean Zé for the computational resource. Uh, thank organizers and colleagues that for, for support for this uh, big uh, workshop and big work. And this is the list of the participants, so that's why we are late, because we are no, no, a huge number. And I think we are at the end. Thank you. I just want to eat. <laughs> so maybe they can ask about the menu. I don't know. <laughs> so I, mean, I have one. Uh, you've been working on diarization, so diarization is nice because there's uh, segmentation, so there's temporal activity, there's a uh, speaker identity, so actually covers a lot of tasks in speech. Um, how do you perceive, um, how do you see the future for this? Uh, how to transpose this to other tasks in speech? ASR, translation, whatever. I think there is a nice panel of people that can answer <laughs> also this question. Uh, so here in, the, in this workshop, we tried to make some general formulation of the problem. So we can adapt it. We have tackled the problem of terrorization, but of course, we can apply this formulation to other problems. In details, I cannot answer, but if there are some people that have more. Thanks. Uh, is Anna here? OK. <laughs> Sorry, you moved. Uh, I have a question about the SNR as uh, the feature for the branch for the uncertainty neural network. Mm -hmm. um, like, how, how do you know that it's better for the uncertainty and not for, like, adding the SNR? Like, have you compared uh, the, the experiment if you add the SNR as an input feature? To the, to the generally or, or to, to original network, structure. yeah. No, I didn't do this experiment. We can try, or, but or I don't know. So here the motivation is that if you have higher noise, you should ha have lower precision. So it, it was used only at the input of this particular branch, uh, which extracts the precision. So the rest of the embedding structure didn't see it. Yeah, uh, like my question is whether it was uh, like camouflaging the uncertainty as a SNR predictor, for example. I don't think so. Okay, oh, yeah. and, and uh, maybe a uh, little bit uh, like a related question is, uh, can you train the model in like multitask learning, not to have it as a input, but the like base model to like uh, be able to give you the representation which has the SNR information there. So you don't have like, you have single model uh, and you don't have to plug in the SNR at inference. 
I'm not sure I, I totally understand what you mean. So, so I, I was, uh, maybe I can recapitulate. If you have like the basic neural network model doing two tasks, mm -hmm. like, and the new task will be the SNR prediction, it, sh it should have like, you, you, you maybe have, you can use it directly for the, SNR, for the uncertainty estimates. Like, do you think like the multitask learning with like so additional task of SNR is something? Uh, the way I see it, maybe not additional task of predicting SNR itself, but you can add additional loss to the, this precision matrices that you estimate and uh, try to encourage them. Again, at training time, you would know which utterances are noisy, which are not. So you can try to push the precisions for the noisy ones to be low and uh, for the clean ones to be high. So kind of in this way, I think you can approach it. But there is no motivation, at least in this framework, to estimate the SNR itself. Okay, yeah, uh -huh. There is some comment. The, I just wanted to complete by the fact that the precision is not uh, a measure of the SNR. SNR is just uh, a marker of low precision. But precision here is really more than that. It's uh, how much interesting information uh, or how, how relevant is the embedding in terms of task-oriented information, and the task-oriented information is not detect the SNR, it's detect the speaker. So it should be more relevant to the amount of speaker information present in the embedding and the, the relevance of this information that uh, SNR. Of course, if the SNR is very low, there is few information, and it's what uh, Anna measure in this case. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. I, I guess it's a nice summarization of this. Any other question? Maybe online? Please try not to give the answer in your question. <laughs> I'll see the comment. Yeah, it's for Thomas. <laughs> so, sorry, Thomas, but you, you said at one time that in integrated, it's linked to the previous comment, in fact. Uh, integrated gradient is indicating the amount of speaker information present. Uh, at one place, place of the uh, file. Are you sure about that? I'm not sure about that. No, that was to gain some time uh, to simplify the explanation. It's the amount of, the amount of information that's going to be used for the system to distinguish or to get two iterances from speak same speaker closer. So because I'm using a really small data set, I, can, I cannot say if it's exactly the speaker information, if it's uh, any other bias from the system that's used, but it's allowing me to look at where, where are the areas on the spectrogram that uh, are used by a system to determine that two segments are closer and closer in the, in the latent space of X vector? So I, I have a complementary question. If, if uh, there is a gender difference between two speakers, so something very easy to find, do you think that the integrated gradient will show a, a huge activity or only a small activity but uh, relevant to gender information is enough to make the difference between the two speakers? That's a good question. I don't think it's going to have, I don't think we're going to have uh, more or less uh, information because I'm normalizing the gradient I'm showing you. But maybe the localization is going to be different uh, over different band of frequen frequencies than, than different difference between speakers. If it's just gender difference, maybe it's going to be. Uh, yeah, on a small area. Any other question? One, two. No, I think everybody is convinced by the <laughs> potential uh, potentiality of explainability. Thank of you. <laughs> Thank you.